Hello, everybody, and welcome to Save or Dice. We are here on this fine, fine Monday with some Numenera Fury. This is a new game brought to you by the Save or Dice crew. Uh, I am the DM, GM, whatever you want to call it here. I am Mike from Limit Gaming. You can find all of our social media links down below for everyone here. We'll do a quick introduction to everybody, get some sponsors out of the way, and then start rolling some dice. So uh, let's start with Kenny. Who are you, and uh, where can people find you? Uh, I'm Kenny. <laughs> Kenny Hill. Uh, Twitch.tv forward slash Kenny Hill. Uh, I'm also known through Dice of Rolling, uh, so you can find us at DiceofRolling.com as well. Sweet. Uh, Bill, who are you and where, where can people find you? Yep, I'm Bill. Uh, I, I have a YouTube channel called Wild Ox Crafting Vids where I show you how to make really cheap and easy terrain for your uh, tabletop role-playing games and war games. Uh, so, yeah, that's me. Awesome. Jordan, who are you and where can people find you? Uh, I am Jordan, and I am right here on YouTube, and you can find me by searching Forgotten Realms Explained. I make uh, little digestible bits of Forgotten Realms lore that you can take and, and chew on so for your Sweet. games or whatever. Sweet. <laughs> uh, and last but definitely not least, Ted, who are you, where can people find you, and who are our today's sponsors? All right, so I am Ted, or others, other people know me as Nerdarchist Ted of Nerdarchy. Uh, you can search Nerdarchy anywhere. We're, we're on Twitch. We're on, on YouTube, our own website. All over social media, you can go go check us out. We do uh, mostly role playing videos. We do live gameplays, lo lots and lots of fun. Whether you want gaming tips or you know what have you, that that's us. Our sponsors for uh, Fury is uh, Dungeon Painter Studio. You know Pyromancers.com. You can go check that out. Awesome maps, ready ready made things that you can insert right into your game. Uh, you know. Cut time off your off your typical prep. Just go there, click the buttons, voila, easy peasy. We also have Arcania Workshop, which make fantastic 3D printed stuff. Whether you want minis, whether you want terrain, it's all it's all there. His his stock and supplying or his options for printing is constantly growing. What, what you see now is not going to be what's there tomorrow. There's going to be m many more options uh, in the near future. Uh, it's great stuff. Go check it out. Sweet. Uh, and there is currently, and I believe for the next few days, a giveaway for Arcania Studios. You guys check the link in the description down below. Enter that giveaway uh, now for a chance to win some cool stuff from them. Um, I as believe the well winner gets to choose three the, of the items. Right. There, you're gonna. There's two. Two people are gonna win. They're gonna get to choose between one of those three packages, as well as between now and March seventh, there is a promo code Saver Dice for uh, a discount off your order. Sweet. Uh, and without further ado, there have been eight previous worlds. You may refer to them as ages, aeons, epochs, or eras, but it's not wrong to think of each as its own individual world. Each former world stretched across vast millennia of time. Each played host to a race whose civilization rose to supremacy, but eventually died or scattered, disappeared or transcended. During that time, each world flourished. Those that rule it spoke to the stars, engineered their physical bodies, and remastered from uh, form and essence, all in their own unique ways. Each left behind remnants. The ninth world is built on the bones of the previous eight, and that is where our story begins. In the lands known as the Steadfast, ruled by the nine rival kings, but more specifically, off the coast of the western shores of the Sea of Gon, where a large expeditionary vessel is being tossed about in the storm. You four find yourself on the deck of the Albatross. This is a large Numenarian vessel, larger than any you have seen before you. Its large blue sails glisten as the lightning crackles across the sky. Its translucent sails kind of waver as the, as the ship pitches and yaws in the sea. Uh, you see before you all of the crewmen of this ship running to and fro, tethering lines, pulling down sails. You see the, the, the helmsman is, is tearing at the helm. The four of you stand there looking confused, stressed, not sure what's happening. None of you are crewmen of the ship. You are here for a different purpose sent by the King of Gon. But it appears as though if you don't pitch in, this ship might not make its destination. You see lightning crackle across the sky. The waves leap upon the deck. The rain beats at your face. Uh, what are you guys doing right now as you stand on this bow of the ship? So you said there's lines that are, you know, kind of going all mm -hmm. all about. Yep. Um, are there, you know, 
is is there any lines that I can I can grab and, and tie Absolutely. off? Absolutely. Sure. You know, anything? Yeah. You anything see, can... you see, there are crewmen. There are uh, they're they're pulling the lines to try to tighten the sails down. Uh, you see, there's there's several lines just kind of flaying in the breeze. You see that the helmsman is struggling against the waves, against the wind, to try to pull the helm to the to the, the wheel to the right direction. Uh, you can hear, you can barely hear over the howling wind and the crackles of thunder. Uh, the captain who is yelling things behind the helmsman, calling out to people uh, all across the ship. That's the man I want to go talk to. Okay. Because I know a man in charge. Perfect. I know nothing about sailing. So cool. he'll tell me what to do. So Silica, you begin to fight your way. You kind of lift whatever kind of cloak you have, and you begin to trudge your way up towards the stairs that lead up to the helm. Um, Zaref, what what are you doing? Are you looking for some lines to pull? Are you looking to, to assist um, these crewmen? I, I'm, I'm good at climbing. I'm good at jumping. So if there's lines that are, like, way out there, I'll have no problems, you know, trying to... Climb the climb the rigging or climb the climb the mast to get up to the ones that other crewmen can't get to. Um, but you know, I'm I'm pretty pretty savvy, um, and I think you know I've spent some time you know having some conversations with the sailors en route. Uh, being being trained as a sailor seems like a good thing to be to to do today. So I'm gonna mark that off as my as my flex. Okay, and try to. Uh, you know, try try to assist as best as possible on those lines. Okay, cool. So for ease of access with your with your flex, you let me know what the flex is, and I'll adjust the math for you. So if you're trying to uh, jump in there, since you've talked to the sailors and you've kind of picked up a few things, you got some lingo down. You know where these these ropes and pulleys lead to. Uh, go ahead and roll me a. Uh, how are you doing this? Are you are you pulling with these guys, or are you trying to cl- uh, you know clamber up the the side rigging and, and tie things down? What what exactly you're trying to do? I would rather go for the for the climbing. Okay. Um, kind of a not not so much a daredevil, just uh, not really a huge concern for my own life. Sure. So, all right, you know, I might wind up in the drink. So what? Okay. Uh, I'll I'll head on head on up the mast or the rigging and try to tie stuff off that that's flailing up there. Okay, awesome. So you can roll me a a a speed check. The CR is five, but because you're trained in sailing now, make it a CR four for you. All right. Uh, I have uh, I have an edge of one in speed, so I okay. will I will lower that as well. Okay, cool. So make that a CR three for you. All right, so I have a fifteen. Uh, you should be able to roll. Oh, we could. You should be able to roll right on the uh, the, the sheet oh, as well, oh. uh, so we can pop up for everyone to see. But a fifteen will work for now. Uh, so a fifteen is a success. That is the exact number you needed to roll. Um, so <laughs> describe to me how you scramble up this rigging and what exactly you are able to tie down and assist these these crewmen in saving the ship from pitching over. Okay, so I you know without without uh, skipping a beat. I uh, you know toss toss my cloak that's that's soaking wet from the storm into a corner so I'm not whisked off off the mast. I just you know scramble scramble up you know grab, grabbing ropes and handholds like it's uh, like it's no problem and then just start tying off the uh, you know the the lines up top so that they can handle the lines down at the bottom. Perfect. So you dramatically throw the cloak up. It goes in the wind. You see it get beaten back down against the boards. uh, And without a care, you scramble up this thing. Uh, Wylock, you, less uh, of the physically inclined, what are you doing to help (laughs) right this ship? Past two days I've held off well, but I can't anymore. And I rush for the nearest uh, railing and start retching over the side. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so you see, in fact, the cloak gets kind of thrown off and it brushes over you and you think that someone kind of bumped into you and that turn, suddenly you feel it come up inside of you and you are back over the Who's edge. That? What's that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Losing it. Gotta go. <laughs> as soon as you start to retch, the, the boat begins to pitch underneath you as you are seeing your face and your recently expelled uh, food mm-hmm. rise up to meet you. And as that momentum sort of flips your stomach... The boat pitches in the opposite direction, and you have to hold on to the railing to not fall back to the other side. Uh, Ari, what are you doing on the deck of the ship? Um, Ari is going to see that the helmsman is having some problems, and he's going to run up there and try to assist him in getting the, the boat to go in the correct direction with his awesome mechanical strong arm. Perfect. So you get up there uh, on the opposite staircase uh, right about the same time Silica gets there as well. You kind of bump into the, the helmsman, and you grab it and sort of mm-hmm. wrench it in the same direction. Uh, you can go ahead and roll me a strength check. It is a uh, challenge rating of five. Uh, so might... Yes, a might check, sorry. 
and then I do challenge rating five, and I mm -hmm. hit submit effect or okay. So now we're just learning Numenera yep. together. So when you when you click <laughs> so when you click might, it should ask you for the the difficulty rating, which is a five. Uh, which and then if you have if you're spending any effort. Uh, which means you would reduce your your might pool by three and spend one effort. Uh, if you have an asset, which you currently don't have an asset, um, right. and I think that's it. Bonuses are, if I'm feeling generous, which tonight, episode one, you shit out of luck. Uh, let's, let's do it. Cool. Failure. Sweet. So you, you charge up there. You kind of bump the, the helmsman. You grab there, and you start to go as hard as you can, but you realize immediately why he is struggling. Um, mm -hmm. And the sh sudden shift of you kind of bumping into him to be all heroic sort of loosens his hands on the on the rods that, that hold the wheel, and you see him slip off one of his hands, and it immediately wrenches you to the side, and it's all you can do to hold it exactly where he is as he scrambles to grab back on here. Uh, Silica, you see this as the, the helmsman and, and Ari, who you've met, before are fighting on this wheel trying to right this boat you see that the as soon as you get closer and closer uh you begin to hear uh the captain uh which again is a person you've met having been on this ship for a few days if not weeks you've, you've kind of lost track of time here uh it's captain quarko cataline uh he is barking commands out and he's points up to uh he points up to zarif and he's shouting at him and you can even this close to him you can barely hear his shouts over the crackling of the thunder and the the howling of the wind whipping against you uh, uh, you approach the man. What do you do? Uh, salute him. Okay. Obviously, obviously you know. Yeah. I'm, he, I'm so paying you, the proper respects, even yeah. in this like tumultuous situation. I'm I'm like a gymnast. I've got the balance. Yeah. The footing doesn't really bother me, so I've just got this salute. Sure. So you're like ice skating across the deck all the way up here, yeah. like just sort of moving with it. Yeah, moving with it, and I ask him, you know, what can I do to serve you, Captain? Uh, so he doesn't really notice the salute. You can see both hands are sort of wildly flying through this thing. Uh, you see that, like, another one of the lines sort of, you hear that twang, that snap, and you can see the, the line fly across. Um, and as he looks to respond to you, uh, seeing you just kind of in action is, is, your, is your action to ask him a question, you hear, uh, barely out in the distance, you hear, Man overboard! Uh, and he immediately looks to you and he says, do what you can. And he points to what you now see as a large sploosh in the water. And you see three crewmen are running towards uh, that side of the boat. Um, and they're trying to fetch rigging or rope or whatever they can to get out to this man. Um, and that seems to be the most pressing matter is saving the crew. Because without them, no one's going to sail this thing. Uh, so what do you do now? Uh, you know, while most people would be kind of scrambling with the rocking back and forth, I'm just, I'm, I'm the arrow. I'm I'm going and I'm diving overboard while popping a water breather <laughs> pill into my mouth because I happen to have one of those. <laughs> oh, <Wait>. okay. <laughs> oh, so oh, you <laughs> charge towards the crew who is currently bringing ropes uh, towards this, this fallen man and you leap into the tumultuous pitching water. Uh whew. What are you trying to do? Just jump to, to like, grab this man as, as, like, you know, lifeguard him? Right, because I can breathe. Oh, right, right. Now. Exactly, yeah. So that's not going to be a problem for me. If I can, I don't have to worry about keeping mm -hmm. myself above water. If I can keep him above water. Okay. You know, lifeguard him from behind. Okay. Under, underneath the arms. So make me. Try, try to keep him up. So because you're carrying a, a, a larger man and you're fighting the sea back as itself, uh, roll me a might. Uh, this is a might task challenge rating or difficulty rating is five. Difficulty five. Uh, no efforts. No assets. Oh my gosh, there's so many questions. <laughs> hey, I have a question. Which sure. side of the boat are they on? They are on the opposite side from where you are vomiting. Okay. Yeah. You can get over there. <laughs> It's not, oh, it's not, it's not too wide of a boat. It's probably like, uh, maybe 10 feet across, 10, 12 feet across. This isn't, this isn't like a large, um, merchant vessel. Uh, you've seen the King of Gone. He has the merchant fleet. You've seen galleons. You've seen these massive merchantry ships. This one is, um, 
if you were to think like a cigarette boat today, but with sails, this is a, a larger, speedier craft um, meant to get you from point A to point B as quickly as possible. Um, in fact, you would know, all of you would know, that this is a specially commissioned expeditionary vessel uh, that is owned directly by the king of, of, uh, of Gaon. And that is why I think everyone is pitching in their, their damnedest to try to save this vessel, because uh, it probably cost as much as the expedition itself. Um, so you dive in and fail. Uh, you dive yeah. in, and you are you can you easily get to this guy. You can breathe under the water. So you you figure I'm going to dive under the waves. It's going to be easier to swim there. You do so, and you see him sort of bobbing and kicking and flailing. And you pop up next to him, and you grab him. And despite the man's flailing arms, you're able to sort of pull him in. But as you're pulling him in, the realization dawns on you that you have no way to get back on the ship as it's beginning to slowly pull away from you, and the lines are being thrown out, and they're just too short as you're kind of one-handedly kicking and pulling water as you can get to that as closely as possible. Uh, we'll say, Wylock, you're the closest person. Uh, you hear this man overboard, you hear the splash, you hear the shouts of the men grabbing things, and you hear a secondary splash, uh, to which you hear several different types of profanity uh, shouting at the second person who clearly intended to jump in. What did you do? <clears throat> so I, I've cleared out enough now that I feel a little mm. bit better. So I assess the situation. I mutter something about why I agreed to this. Mm -hmm. And I make my way over, and I'm thinking, can I try to use hedge magic to levitate? It sounds like I can't throw the rope far enough. Yep. It's flopping down, but sure. can I levitate the rope out so that it, it goes as far as it needs to? Yep. Cool. Okay, so, uh, so hedge magic for you is cost of one intellect point. However, you have one edge in your intellect point, which means it costs nothing for you. Uh, so you... How, what does it look like when you use this hedge magic? Because in this world, it's not really magic. It's one of those uh, technology is sufficiently advanced enough that everything looks like magic. So what does it look like when you control the nanos around you, the nanites, uh, and maneuver this rope out to your allies? Uh, I stride up very unconfidently, but stride nonetheless, <laughs> to where the guys are trying to throw the ropes. I reach out one hand, which gets illuminated with a, a blue glow. Nothing too fancy. Mm-hmm. The rope starts to glow the same color, levitates up, becomes like straight, straight as a board, and works its way out to cover the most people possible, however many are in the water, so that all of them might be able to grab on. And then turn it off, and the rope falls in. Sweet. Uh, so I will say, uh, Silica, you see this rope sort of, you know, uh, serpentine out towards you, <laughs> bloom, and sort of splash in. Um, you are able to grab this you now have an asset to get in there. So it is still a five to carry this uh, this drowning man through the tumultuous waves, but you have a plus one asset. Now you can spend effort to pull yourself in if you so choose, but this is so far a might check uh, with a difficulty rating of five. So roll again to... Mm -hmm. So roll, roll again to try to pull yourself in. We're, we're trying to reel ourselves in at this yeah. point. I've grabbed the rope. I don't yep. have to roll. Grab. <laughs> right, you've already got the rope. That's a simple task. So it's a CR5 to, to pull yourself against this tumultuous as the boat is kind of pulling away from you, right? Uh, so you're kind of getting dragged in the wake of it at this point. Um, yikes, no. that was almost super bad. So you're still holding the rope. So you're not getting any further out. Um, oh, I just can't so you, yeah, you've got this. Your, your grip on the man is slipping, but you have the rope. Uh, it's getting to the point where you're going to have to make a choice. Uh, Ari and Zarif, you all see this. What do you guys do? Help, help. Uh, can I swing down uh, and begin pull, pulling the rope in? It's like, you know, hand over, uh, you know, hand, hand over hand so that all she's got to do is hold on to the rope and to the crewman rather than trying to swim and, and grab. Absolutely. Uh, so you, you know, expertly swing down this thing. Uh, Ari, do you make a dive for this as well? Or do you continue to hold on to the, the helm at this point? Um, if the, is the guy, is he up? I mean, the, the guy that was holding the helm originally, the is helmsman, he back up? the helmsman is, he... is back up standing on it and he is still at the same point of struggling with it. Uh, you could assist him in helping him right the direction or you could let him keep, the, he's, he seems to be able to keep the position of where it is. He doesn't seem to be able to write it on himself. Yeah, I think he's got this. So okay. I'll probably run down there and, uh, 
can I pull a rope up or can I assist yeah. uh, Zarif? Yeah. So let's say you guys get there at the same time, and I think I think I think Zarif uh, or, or Zarif is it Zarif? Zarif. 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 I think I think Zarif. <laughs> I think Zarif makes the the, uh, the appropriate judgment call, seeing your bulky frame, uh, and lets you do the majority <laughs> of the work as he assists yeah. you. So Ari, go ahead and roll me a. It is still a uh, a might. Uh, uh, difficulty rating of five, and you have, uh, let's call it two assets. Okay, two assets. No bonus. <laughs> oh. Hot damn, everybody. <laughs> We're going to lose them right now. This is how we lost the game. One, Episode guys. one, you lose. Uh, so you guys are getting them in. You're, you're pulling the rope, but now they are up against the side of this thing, and, and Silica, you see the waves are just sort of washing over you as you're in the wake of that boat. Um, and it appears as though you have one more chance before you have to make a choice, you or this man. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> huh. So you can roll, you can roll that, yep, you can roll that might. You get, you get two assets because you have allies pulling you in and because you have the rope. But if you fail this roll, it's a choice. Either you get the man on the boat or you let go of the man. I mean, I can't possibly make three bad rolls in a row, can I? I mean, <laughs> statistically, who knows Why at this point? Why would you say it out loud? I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm hoping. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for it. Okay, you're gonna apply. You're gonna apply effort. To you, you can apply effort and spend points out of your your might pool. When do those resupply or? Uh, you see the see the recovery rolls right below that. Oh, that okay. That's, That's how. One. All right. Oh, that okay. No, I, no, we're good. We're fine. <laughs> oh! You are not fine. You feel, <laughs> as you begin to pull yourself up, again, you're one-handed because you have the other hand wrapped around this guy. You feel the rope begin to slip as it is now sodden with water. Uh, and you have this the, whatever vestiges of clothing that hasn't torn off this guy that you're kind of holding on to. And you see your the crew, you can barely hear their shouts over the sound of the water just spilling over your head. Uh, and you know that it's come down to the fact that you could only save one of you. You can either get the man to the rope and let go, or you can let go of the man and get yourself safely back on that boat. I mean, I can breathe underwater for the next eight hours. Mm -hmm. You are in open ocean with no land in sight. So that eight hours will be, uh, they, those time. could be your last eight hours. <laughs> Just, just saying. If you, <laughs> if you tie the rope to his hand, we pull him in. We throw another rope to you. Just, those are options. Those, those are options. So if you're, you're a well-worn uh, exploring veteran, Zarif. Uh, if you're shouting this down to her, this is an option you can do. I will, I will absolutely do that. T tie him on. We will throw you another rope. I mean, I'm gonna go for, like valiant to a fault. Mm -hmm. She she's not gonna let this guy go. Okay. So I'm I'm gonna tie it off under his arms. Yep. I I figure I'm gonna take my chances with the water breathing and try to hold out for another rope. Okay, cool. Uh, so I will let you tie this off. It's a relatively simple knot. You sort of just like give him a a, a, a painful slip knot to his chest, oh, yeah. whatever the quickest knot you can do is uh, in this situation. And you see it like zzz, tighten to his chest and you see whatever water was in his mouth sort of spill out as he feels the compression in his chest. Oh, and you- for what? Yeah, and you, <laughs> you let go as you see him slowly inch away from you as more lines get thrown out towards you. Uh, Wylock, you see the same thing happening as the lines are, are, you know, they're hitting the water and trailing just too far, and she's swimming as fast as she can against this tumultuous water. Uh, do you do the same thing? Do you see some hedge magic to try to get this out there? Is there other, any other way you can assist with that? Um, the only thing I'm thinking is, like, you ever seen that movie, A Beautiful Mind, with mm -hmm. Russell Crowe? He plays John Nash. There's a scene where he takes the orange slice and he reflects the sun's light and he sees, like, patterns. Sure. So I'm looking at all the rigging of the ship, and I'm seeing they're glowing, and I'm, like, picturing the best way to rig up pulleys and which ropes can be sacrificed. Yep. That we could just cast them out and be able to retrieve both of them and use the torque of the ship or something to do it all in one fell swoop. Okay. Now, are you trying to do this by yourself, or are you trying to tell someone else how to do this? Well, I'm trying to see if there is a solution, and yep. if there is, then I'll shout it out. Okay, cool. Uh, make me an intellect challenge, uh, unless you have anything that you think could be more important. Perhaps uh, training in Numenera. This is a difficulty rating five. I don't think it'd be Numenera. It's just sort of looking for like the math of it. But okay. Um, but I'm, my my background in the uh, 
with what my particular ailment did to me, um, I would think might afford me a one level. Uh, I will say nature of the universe. Yeah, How does its work. You know what? <laughs> are you are you calling on a moment of clarity? Yeah, we'll say that I'm um, looking around. Everything's going south, mm -hmm. and then you have that spark of creativity. Cool. Yes. So right. I will give you one asset for that, and you okay. can describe to me what it looks like when you go from hectic, erratic, and kind of this this weird, mousy kind of guy to completely lucid and fully aware of the machinations of the universe. Right. Well, the, the first thing I did didn't work. So suddenly the hunch stops. I straighten up. I look around. Everything gets very quiet for me. The ropes, like I said, they're, for me, they're glow I'm seeing a solution, a mathematical solution, how we can get this done. So, uh, what'd you say? It was I click the. the so you, you click. You click intellect. There should be a dice symbol right next to intellect. Okay. You click on that, and then it should say what the difficulty level is, which should be five, and okay. it will ask you if you have any assets, which you have one. Uh, I'm also putting. I'm gonna put effort into this. Okay, so reduce your intellect pool by three and put one effort in. Okay. No bonus. Which will effectively success. You needed to roll a uh, a fifteen and you rolled an uh, so you need to roll a uh, a nine and you rolled a an eleven. So you totally nailed it. So you see the mathematics. You see the geometry of how the rigging is set up. <clears throat> And you know exactly which of these lines that these guys is holding is connected to which tether, which goes to which pulley, which is on the boom hinge. And you know that if you get that line to her, you can activate this switch, which will reel that line in uh, and save. It will, it will guarantee to save one of them immediately. Um, so you tap that guy in the shoulder uh, and he looks to you confused as to whatever you're spouting, whatever nonsense it sounds like you're saying. Uh, and he finally realizes that you want him to throw his rope to her and he does so. He, he knocks the rope back and he hauls as much of it over his head as he possibly can. Um, and just as it looks like it is going to be out of reach, Silica, you, you grab it. As you take one more uh, breaststroke, it hits your hand uh, and you are able to grab, you kind of, slinked into it as you are able to hold on to the last vestiges of this rope. Um, and once you are secure, uh, Wylock, you know exactly which pin to pull on that pulley system <laughs> to have that thing flywheel her back onto the ship. Cool. So you, Wa you, water you, ski across the oh ocean yeah. is like pulling me. Oh yeah, for sure. So you, <laughs> you yank the pin out uh, and this thing... And it sort of spins all the way up, and it's it, everyone just sort of looks. At it. It's like it's one of those Rube Goldberg contraptions. Does it like tink, 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 tink all the yeah. way across? Uh, <laughs> Silica, in what amazing acrobatic fashion do you land on top of this deck? Uh, full gainer, just full gainer, right onto the deck. Sure, superhero pose. Just stick the landing. Yeah, awesome. Uh, everyone just sort of looks in shock as whatever Wylock just did happened, and then you landed gracefully like you planned this the entire time. And then everyone realizes that their friend is still drowning, and they begin to pull him in as best they can. Um, with the I don't think Ari and I would have let go of the rope. I think we yeah. would have kept going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, the, you, with the assistance of Ari and Zaref, you guys begin to pull this guy in, um, and you pull him in, and when he plops onto the deck, uh, you see that his eyes have kind of lolled back uh, and he isn't breathing. Um, it seems as though he has taken on too much water. Uh, he doesn't seem to be dead yet, as far as you can tell. Uh, but is there anything you guys can think of to do that would save this guy? I know some of medic. you are. I know some of you are keen adventurers. Um, you say medic, and one of the the crewmen sort of looks around, doesn't see the the appropriate guy, and you see him dive below deck uh, into one of the the holds as he goes to look for the the corpsman. Um, you know that that the corpsman's going to take a solid like minute or two to get up here with the with the pitching of this of this boat. Um, this guy is just kind of splayed out. Um, everyone looks around. Uh, you can see their faces sort of drop into the knowledge that they know they can't save this guy, but that if they don't return to their job, the entire ship might break apart. So with reserved faces and just forlorn expressions, these guys all quickly begin to turn. Um, trusting in the fact that the corpsman will come and save this guy, and they start running back to their positions, and you see them again running through cranks, and they're they're pulling the winches out, and they're they're lining the they're pulling down the ropes. Um, 
Ari, Zaraf, this man is at your feet. Wylock, uh, you are paces away. And Silica, you are still in a pose waiting for applause. And when you finally get none, you lower your arms and realize that there is a dead body on the dock, uh, on the deck of this ship. Uh, what do the four of you guys do? Do you return to work or do you return to uh, attempt to save this guy's life? Uh, there is there is nothing that I, I have medical that's going to assist here. Mm-hmm. Um I know that that Silica and Wylock they they've they've got some some oomph, so I kind of look to them like, all right, what's next? Sure. Uh, so I he put, looks to uh, you, Ari. What are you doing? I'm gonna put my hand on his chest, and seeing that when we we got the rope around him, like water came out, and I'm like, oh, he's just got more water in his lungs. Mm-hmm. Like we got to get it out. So I'm gonna put a firm hand on his <laughs> chest and and strong but gentle i don't want to like okay. break a rib sure but push like really hard and really fast to see if i can like push out all this water sure you want to invent the heimlich maneuver uh <laughs> yes. make me a might difficulty three Hell yeah. Cool. So you rolled a mini crit in Numenera. Uh, So now you don't have extra damage, but you can have a minor effect. So you succeed at exactly what you were trying to do. And what minor effect would you like to happen? Uh, My Uh, suggestion would be this guy wakes up immediately is an easy minor effect. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like, I think he just needs to wake up immediately and start coughing and and be able to help us again if possible. Cool. Yeah. So you press your hand uh, right (laughs) below, right below the the solar plexus and you just sort of shove in at the base of his, uh, at the base of his ribs uh you feel your palms sink in uh and then immediately uh similar to what wylock was doing right before someone fell in a just torrent of water comes out of his mouth and he sputters back to life eyes opening seeing you sort of bent over with your massive metal arm pressed to his chest and he (laughs) what happened where am i you know, get back to work. <laughs> and he looks up at you with the with the fear of whatever god he believes in, and he sort of scrambles to his feet, rubbing his chest, which you can you can tell it's not broken, but that's going to be an Ari sized handprint there for a good minute. <laughs> um, as he quickly looks around to whatever rigging needs to be redone, and he begins to go back at it. Um, what are the rest of you doing, Zaref, Wylock, and Silica? You are all still on the dock, uh, the the deck of this ship. The ship is still. T- you know, tilting and turning and, and shifting in the waves. Um, you know that you have to get through this storm. Um, and as far as you knew, as you approached it, this this uh, there was no land in sight as of yet. So the, the captain's on the other side. Is there is there someone that seems to be you know leading the people on on this side? You know, deck master or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, yes, you look around for that and you recognize there are two people uh, that seem to be. Uh, you know, issuing out the captain's commands, kind of listening back. Uh, you see that there is the first mate, uh, which is Tivin Brith. Uh, you've met uh, her before several times. Um, and there is the bosun, uh, who is usually the guy in charge of the storage, the foodstuffs, all that kind of thing. Uh, but he is a large, burly, barrel-chested man. Uh, and it's Bosun Dorisha is, is his name. Um, and you see both of them are, you know, painstakingly carrying out the, the orders of the captain and relaying them as they hear them um, with, with great fervor. Uh, so you so see what, both of them. They are both uh, on opposite sides of this uh, towards the sails of this, uh, towards like the, the mast. So what, whatever, whatever they're issuing that needs to be done, whichever, you know, seems to have the, the least amount of hands at it, mm-hmm. I will, I will go, go to it. Absolutely. So you begin to go to one of the sides of the ship. Let's say it's the right side of the ship. I don't know ship terms. Uh, You get over to the right side of the ship and you begin grabbing ropes and you're you're working on that. Um, Ari, what are you doing right now? I think I'm going to run back up to the helmsman and try to help him and and see if he knows where to go is what I'm hoping. Because we we don't know where we're going. I'm hoping that there's some... There's probably not a star in the sky or anything. Sure. But maybe he has a compass, and yep. we know that we need to go east. And I'm going to yeah. try and, and direct the ship into that, that area. Okay, so you run up there. What is your experience, except for your arm, with Numenaren devices? Uh, I would say very little. Okay. I think he, he grew up in, like, a mining town. There was no – I mean, it was just uh, smiths and, and, and mining and stuff like that. Sure. And so this was an oddity that his arm changed into this weird robotic thing. He knows enough to like repair himself. Like he's figured that out. Like, oh, there's dents and I've got to like, you know, pop out dents and replace screws and what have you because it's becoming more mechanical than flesh. Sure. So you get up there and you've noticed it from the moment you saw this ship docked in the city of Bridges that this is the most Numenera you've ever seen in one place. Right. 
you get up to the helm, and now that you're kind of looking to see if there's a direction or a way to help this guy, the entire helm itself is a Numenaran device. It appears to be made of all one translucent piece of metal, you're assuming? Uh, you're not entirely sure what this is. Stone, translucent stone, some kind of glass, maybe a, a translucent metal, you're not sure. But built into the rod that sort of sinks it to the dock, uh, the deck, sorry, is this ocular globe that seems to have several spinning reticles inside of it. Um, and every once in a while, the, the helmsman looks down at this and then looks back up and he can see something. You're not entirely sure what he sees. Um, and as he turns to look, you see that in his left eye, in his left orbital socket, is a similar device that almost matches whatever is on that rod. Um, and you see that there are several, like, slashes around this this eye cavity. Um, it looks like this is an implant that he is the helmsman. And if this guy goes down, you guys are screwed uh, kind of situation. Um, he looks to you. Uh, and he kind of flinches back, assuming you're going to bump him again. And he grabs the wheel harder uh, and looks to you and says, what? what is it? I'm, I'm here to help. What What do you need? I'm muscle. Here. And he like grabs your metal hand and puts it on the thing, on the, on the, on the helm. And he says, we need to keep this heading. Uh, uh, two knots to the right. And he like realizes that you have no idea what the hell he says. And he says, yeah, I already heard right. <laughs> so he just starts. Get, get this pin center. And he starts to wheel it. So he points to one of the rods on the, on the helmet. And he begins to, to pull this thing. Um, and you can make me that same uh, might uh, difficulty rating five. And I'll give you an assist on that because he is actively helping you this time. All right, here we go. Yeah. Perfect. Whoa, sh man, <laughs> just keep rolling those. Cool. We just uh, had to get those bad rolls out of the way. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, so you do, now that you understand what's happening here, uh, you grab this thing, you know, this pin needs to go to the center, and you wrench it free. Um, and you wrench it free in a way that now you're 100% you're sure you could take this helm and hold it exactly where it is, and you don't need this guy's help. However, he is the helmsman, and he's going to stay by your side. Uh, is there any other major effect you'd like to happen? Uh, jeez. Um... I don't know. Help? Friends? What do we want? Major effect. <laughs> yeah, you guys can throw out suggestions. Well, clearly, the fact that we're now properly on course, it's a sign of, uh, of good passage and the storm lessens. That doesn't happen. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> this isn't Disney's uh, Numenera game. That's not how storms work. <laughs> perhaps, I like uh, your gumption. Perhaps a major effect. If we need to keep it in this center pin, maybe um, now that we have it stable like the the currents kind of change and it's not fighting back against mm -hmm. us as much we can kind of like like it's almost like locked in place yeah we're like oh okay like this is this feels right yeah so you get the cruise control the ship cruise control on right yeah like okay almost yeah so so if i <laughs> if i'm needed elsewhere i could run around cool yeah so you get it so that he is able to you like yeah. lock it in a way that he is able to to keep this this bearing as well uh we'll jump over to why lock you are now on the opposite side of the deck uh this side is vomit free what would you like to do well the clouds have returned and after the whole commotion with the overboard finished up everyone took off and I started freaking out again because life's hard enough as it is. And now you've got me on a boat mm -hmm. and it's rocking back and forth. We're in a huge storm and I go for the other railing and it happens again. Perfect. Uh, so as you have the first uh, 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 Silica, you hear this uh, and you see that Wylock has returned to retching over the side of this boat. Uh, and you stand in a commotion of people who seem very unimpressed with your amazing landing, uh, <laughs> despite the pose uh, awarding of applause at the end of it. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, I'm a little concerned for Wylock's well-being. Mm -hmm. And since I have you know, a good grasp on my balance, I'm going to go and try to just sort of comfort him and, and kind of keep him steady. Cool. Uh, I've done my duty to this man who went overboard, mm -hmm. but I'd also prefer not to be under the eye of the captain at this point, since I also needed saving. Right. I don't want to make him angry. <laughs> that, and you saw a man go overboard, and he is this, this, this Wylock person is, is leaning overboard and could be the next one to fall. Um, yeah. So how do you go and comfort him and or make him feel better? Uh, I, you know, I, I stride over, very confident. I'm just like, buck up, buddy. <laughs> It's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be okay. You, the charming, uh, the charming person, comes over and says, uh, "Hey, it's November lip." Uh, perfect. Uh, so you just come over and your abrasive approach doesn't make him feel better or worse. Uh, no, probably not. And I'm sure he kind of. 
and looks at you uh, as he retches some more. Um, and as I'll lightning, yeah, and as lightning peels across the sky, uh, we'll say Ari, as you're leaving uh, the helmsman uh, and Zarif, as you are pulling rope, you see this lightning streak across the sky and fork and it hits the mast. And you see it run down the sails as if the sails themselves were made out of some strange metal, where in fact they are made out of some translucent blue Numenera and something. You're not sure what it is. But you see the lightning trace down these things, and then it hits five or six places after the splits into the deck, and you see small burned holes and fire begin to rise up. And as your vision clears from the white, hot, blazing light of that lightning storm, you find yourselves in the city of Gon, or in the kingdom of Gon, in the city of Bridges. The city is full of reverie, and it is the day you departed. There is... The common folk have gathered on all of the bridges. Now, this city is on a dock that stretches out hundreds of feet into the ocean. You see that there are several boats that have arrayed themselves around the various docks. There is the Coral Castle. Uh, not actually made of coral, you were disappointed to find, Ari. Uh, but more of some strange kind of metal. Um... And you see there are people all over the place. You see that the in full resplendent regalia, you see that, that Laird, King Laird, the, the king of the kingdom of Gon, is out there. Uh, and he is speaking into some ornate, orbular box. It's this very strange, like, oval with some, like, antennas sticking out of it. But he's speaking into it, and somehow his voice is being projected throughout the crowd into the people. Uh, you see there are children playing across the docks. Um, there is this strange game where they kind of stretch out rope between two docks, and they're spinning it over the water as one person dives, like what you would imagine in the real world is the dolphin uh, over this rope, kind of like a jump rope, but aquatic style. Um, and you can make out what is happening here uh, as you are all in a procession leading towards this boat, the albatross. You see the size of the boat are emblazoned in this pearlescent white color. You're not sure if it's, if it's some kind of paint, some kind of inking, or if it's the actual material the boat is made out of. Uh, you see that the, the deck of the boat is finely polished, glinting off the sun. You see it's blazing blue. Numenaran sails are sort of already projected out as if wind was pushing them, um, when in fact there is no wind here at all. And in the distance, on the far side of this boat, you see the storm rising. And your voice is brought, your, your thoughts are brought back as the king turns to everyone and says, And these are the heroes that will venture and brave the fury of this storm and bring our resplendent merchant fleet back to the coast of the Steadfast. And then the, the entire crowd, you feel all their eyes rotate towards the procession and loud clapping, uh, you know, kind of happens and it's like an uproar. And this is the most attention the majority, except for you, Silica, have received in a long time. And everyone seems to be cheering for you, despite you not really having done anything. But you've all done something, right? You've all earned the eye of the king. So let's go around and introduce our characters here. Ari, you come from a small mining village, wherein you touch some kind of strange ore that seemed to graft itself to your arm and begin slowly growing up your body. What drew the eye of the King Laird? What was impressive enough that you earned a spot on this expeditionary fleet that he thought you could save the day and stop this storm? Ari is incredibly strong, and part of that is the gift of this Numenera that has taken over his arm and leg, um, which made him an excellent miner in this small mining community, but it also made him an outcast. And when they were looking for volunteers, the mayor pretty much came to me and said, you are going to volunteer because we want you out of the town. We want to make sure that you're not going to infect other people with this and we're scared of what you're becoming. So reluctantly, he joined mostly to, because he loves his town and he loves the people in his town and he wanted them to be happy and safe because he doesn't know if he is a danger. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe his new skills could be better used in other places. Okay, so you were sort of banished from your own town as a sort of pariah, yeah. forced in a to, way. <laughs> okay, forced to volunteer. Volunteers though still need to prove themselves as 
capable members of this voyage. Uh, it doesn't just get sent everybody out there. You have to have some kind of skill that he believes that could put an end to this storm and bring back his merchant fleet, which, as you've come to know, is the lifeblood of the Sea Kingdom of Gaan. So what was it? What was the skill? What was the, what was the feat of great strength that you did that impressed the king enough to earn you a spot on this boat? Uh, there was definitely a collapse in the mine and uh, three of the miners were trapped. And it was, I'm gonna say, some kind of leverage, but just sheer strength to pry open an opening and hold it with my shoulders so that the miners could like run out of the mine safely before I like run out and it collapsed entirely. Okay, perfect. And it was that holding up a mountain that I became known for. Okay. Uh, so the mayor of Omar wrote you a letter of recommendation uh, to bring to the uh, to, to King Laird, right? So how much of the letter is true, and how much of the letter was embellished? Uh, I'm guessing, I'm guessing about seventy percent embellished. Okay, uh, <laughs> perfect. Um, and I'm sure that Ari will never admit to that. Um, yeah. We have a super chat uh, going on right now from Morgan Ritson. Two dollars. Fingers crossed for that sweet Oprah cameo. I have no idea what that means. Uh, <laughs> if someone in chat could tell me what the Oprah cameo is. Did I say Oprah? Did someone else say Oprah? I have um, no idea why you would yeah, think Oprah's Rick coming in. Time movie. Oh, but okay. Good. Got it. I think the setting reminds them of Wrinkle in Time. Perfect. I was completely lost on that because I've read the book and haven't seen the movie yet. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Thank you for the super chat, and I'll see about working Oprah in, uh, in some way. Jeez. <laughs> um, uh, with that, you're kind of pulled back towards the crowd as the eruption of cheer um, sort of snaps you out of that moment where you're in the mine, and you realize that this isn't the screams of your friends trapped in a mine, but the cheers of people, you know, sort of pushing you on to do more great things. Uh, as we cut over to Zareph. Zareph, you are a veteran explorer uh, who I assume volunteered for this mission with some kind of gusto. Uh, what was the deed that brought you to the eye of King Laird that earned you a spot on this boat? So Zareph is a, as you said, an explorer. He he wound up finding a a new Minera that kind of makes the the bright light, you know, uh, a bit of a bother for him. So he tends to spend a little bit more time underground in ruins and caves. Uh, well, he, he came upon a, a Numenera, a relic, something that he wasn't certain, you know, what exactly it was. And he, he brought it back to uh, so, some noble. And it turns out that it was able to be to be used to, um, like, lift everyone in that town, you know, uh, up a little bit more. You know, the you know, food grew a little bit better. Uh, every everyone's quality of life just got got raised by the by this one one device. You know, to him, like you know, he did a he did a good deed. He didn't really think anything of it, but you know, other people called him a hero. Okay, awesome. Uh, so again, you are brought back from that moment to the eruption of cheers and clapping um, and just kind words as you sort of serpentine your way through this crowd in the most elongated, elaborate procession towards this boat, um, you slowly begin to realize this being likely one of your first times uh, really admiring the, the city of Bridges, that there is no straight path from where you were to the boat. And in fact, you're winding around most of the city, crisscrossing across all these bridges that sort of uh, overlap and interconnect. As not, we go... uh... Oh god! Not not having you know uh, a whole lot of desire for attention and no desire for the bright shining orb that's in the sky. Mm -hmm. He pulls his cloak a little bit more over his eyes. Yeah, you sort of tighten down and sort of huddle up uh, in that that almost Strider esque uh, walk as you sort of somberly move to the boat. Um, for as you as you look across the the prow of the ship and you see the storm um, that now the closest you've ever been to it just how treacherous it looks. This could be your last adventure. As we no, cut I over... It, I okay. it with a smile. Yeah. Because <laughs> death is the last great adventure. Uh, as we cut over to Wylock, uh, you've had a sordid past, if you remember any of it at all, but in recent times, something has drawn the eye of the King of Gone. What was that? I inadvertently thwarted the assassination attempt on his daughter. 
And how did that go? For the past two months, ever since I woke up with this blue gemstone lodged in my forehead, I've been wandering around trying to remember who I am or, or what's going on. Very paranoid, very, not schizophrenic, but uh, on edge. It's just the way I am because I see the world differently now. So I came to the city. What's the main city? This main city is called the City of Bridges. Okay. So I came to the City of Bridges. Uh, it so happened that in one of the major squares, there was a procession going on. Um, a big carriage or whatever the equivalent is. And, uh, but I noticed one, one, something was odd. One of the bystanders in front, uh, I noticed a glowing coming from inside of his cloak. And uh, it turns out it was a weapon. So I had a moment of clarity. It was actually my first one and where all of the paranoia went away. The clouds cleared and I knew exactly what, had, what was going on and what had to happen. Mm -hmm. So I tackled the guy. Long story short, guards came in. It was understood what was gonna happen. And uh, they brought me in to meet King Laird. And from there, he said, hey, given that you have nothing else going on, why don't you do this? So on your person right now, you have fragments of a metal egg. This is, for mechanical purposes, one of your oddities. Now, an oddity is just a strange item that you carry on your person. It could have a use. It could have no use. It could just be a neat thing. You carry the fragments of a silver metallic egg, roughly the size of what we know as a football. This was, in some way, the weapon on the man that you tackled. This glow that it emitted, you can actually still see some of the remnants on the internal carapace of this egg. Um, this, it's sort of like this, this webbing. In fact... In, in some of your moments of clarity, you can actually see similarities between the internal fibers of the egg and what the Sea, uh, the, the sea Kingdom has built the uh, sails out of. Uh, now, in this moment of clarity, what you put together is that this man was an agent of the much-feared Octopi Kingdom, which is a thing in Numenera. The Octopi are far more intelligent than they are now in the real world, uh, and they have an elaborate undersea kingdom, which is threatened by the Sea Kingdom of Gon on a regular basis. Now, most people don't know this unless you're heavily embroiled in the politics of the Sea Kingdom of Gon, but you were able to figure it out. This egg was some kind of Numenaran octopi egg, and this man was an agent of them. And by having this moment of clarity and tackling this guy, you shattered the egg, and whatever it would have become, it didn't. Um, with your walking around, probably what procked your moment of clarity, walking around kind of absentmindedly through the city, uh, you've actually seen several fragments of this before. Uh, it seems as though several eggs have washed up on the shore before, but their intended recipient didn't find them. Whatever came out of the eggs, you're not entirely sure what that was. Perhaps it was the intended recipient uh, being some kind of Numenaran clone. Uh, you're not sure, but you've also collected fragments of these splintered eggs you've seen along the coastline as well. So you have a small satchel containing these fragmented metallic eggs with weird blue webbing on the inside. What they do, you're not sure. What they carried, you're not sure. Um, okay. As you kind of come back to... Uh, you, you hear the booming voice of the king uh, reminds you of the time you walked through the echoing halls of the Coral Palace to his excitement that you saved his daughter uh, and the fact that he offered you uh, in person uh, by his own mouth uh, a position on this as such a great, uh, you know, smart, one of the, the thinkers of this age. Um, However, of course, by that time, your moment of clarity had ended and you weren't really sure what he was offering you. But here you stand in this procession, confused as to why you're here, walking towards a boat that is headed clearly for a disastrous storm. Uh, and last, we'll go over to Silica, who has done nothing great, probably in the majority of her life. But what are you doing here? And how did you get here? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm too, too young to have done anything or really made a name for myself. Uh but I really like to talk <laughs> and I can be convincing sometimes. And I know that the first rule of life in the ninth world is when life hands you an adventure or the opportunity for an adventure, you take it. And so I had heard about this opportunity and I found the right people to talk to or annoy until they let me go. <laughs> Perfect. And who were these people that you talked to and annoyed? My father. And who is your father? <laughs> Uh, he's a part of the Senate. Okay. So awesome. that 
explains the teacup and the silver spoon and the sort mm -hmm. of buck up buddy attitude and nothing, everything just kind of slides off my back because nothing's ever really gone wrong for me. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> and as you weave your way, chin held high, you know, expecting to have been here, there's no reason you shouldn't. Of course, why would there be? You guys make your way to the the side of this boat. Um, you're now so close to the 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 microphone, uh, this this you know, uh, this vo vocal augmenter uh, that it's hard to actually hear what it is. It's like standing next to a bass speaker where just, whoop, 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 whoop. Um, and you see glaring down at you, Silica, uh, you see a woman uh, with, with bright platinum white hair wearing an elaborate green garb with shoulder poofs kind of puffed up here with yellow stripes. Uh, and Morgan, I look at you in chat, um, as the woman sneers down at you and you recognize that she is another member of the Senate. Uh, in fact, this is uh, advisor uh, Jasper Pavnus, uh, and she doesn't like your shit. Um, she knows how you got here. She knows who you are and knows that you have no business here. And she doesn't like you, your father, or the rest of your ilk. Uh, so she sneers down at you from the side of the king, unable to say anything that would sway him to remove you from this ship as the plank sort of and hits the dock, allowing all of you to board passage along the albatross. Uh, you guys all proceed down this, this, this dock. Uh, the, the, the sea king turns to you and he smashes the ceremonial Numenaren device uh, on the side of the boat uh, and everyone erupts with cheers. Oh, this is amazing. Um, our saviors. The crowd goes wild um, as the boat begins to slowly peel off. You see the crew, very Titanic-esque, begin to wave. Um, and I'm sure all of you guys have your own uh, sort of send-offs. I'm sure Silica's is very expressive uh, and, and Wylox is confused and Zarev's is non-existent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I gotta go. uh, and he immediately goes below deck. Uh, and as you guys pull out of the dock uh, of this ship and you begin to see the helmsman turn into the storm, you guys see the impending lightning strikes and these, these purples and greens are streaking across uh, the, these, these dark roiling clouds as you begin to leave the docks and leave the safety of the Steadfast behind you as you pilot your craft directly into the heart of the storm. We find ourselves back on the ship, covered in rain, sloshing over the top. Lightning crackles in. As soon as your eyes clear from the white strike, you see that there are several tears in this, uh, this blue-hewn um, sails. And you see where the tears happen. The blue light is starting to ebb and it becomes black. And you see that whatever was powering the sails, because surely they must have been powered, is dying. Which means no wind will get you where you need to go. And you see that where the lightning struck the vessel, there are small fires erupting uh, as you guys are proceeding through the storm. These fires raise up blue and purple and green and are like no fire you've ever seen before. Uh, Zareph, you are the closest to one of these fires. What are you doing? It's got, uh, fires got to get put out. Fires on a boat are, uh, you know, they're, they're death. So mm -hmm. uh, I know it's probably dangerous. These aren't normal fires. But like you said, they're small. Mm -hmm. Right now, they're I'm, small. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and you know boot stomp them, trying to just pat it out. Sure. I know um, it's gonna hurt. <laughs> so there is, uh, so all around you, there were like like let's say twelve to fifteen different spindles of of the remaining thin lightning that hit the ground. Uh, around you, there is a blue, a purple, and a green. Which one do you go to to attempt to stomp out? Blue. Okay, uh, so you run over to this thing and you begin to stomp this out. Every time your boot hits, it seems to impact with this blue flame, which splashes and makes small, tiny little flickers and tongues of fire as you stomp it out and it seems to splash. This fire seems to be almost liquid as if you're jumping in a puddle and it seems to be spreading with every stomp of your boot on the deck. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, you look to your left down the, the, the bow of this ship and you see there sort of in a sopping uh, mess is your cloak. You're not sure if it will help you, but you know it's the only thing you have besides taking someone else's cloak. Do you make uh, a dive for it? I, I do. Okay, so you take off running. With every step, you leave a blue foot, fi flaming footprint as you run towards this thing. Um, 
I think Wylock and Silica, you are uh, aware that this happened. Wylock, you may be able to steal your nerves enough to do something, but Silica, you have brusquely attempted to assist him in his weakened state, but you now see that there is a rainbow of fire spilling across the deck to different effect. What do you do? I'm looking for a bucket. I need okay. a bucket. <laughs> Which sure. is probably already full of water at this point. Absolutely. With the rain and the waves, yeah. So there is a bucket nearby. You find a bucket or a barrel, whatever you can pull over there. Um, yeah. You find one that is slid up between the staircase uh, leading up to the helm that you can easily grab. It must have gotten tossed there in the waves. You easily grab it, and as soon as you do, you immediately feel that weight that this thing is full of. You have a pail of water. Um, there are the same colors, purple, blue, and uh, uh, purple, blue, and green around you. Which one do you go to? Whichever is closest. Sure. So you go to not the blue one because it would be uh, less fun to do the same thing over and over again. Uh, you go to the <laughs> green one and you just take that bucket. And I assume you just sort of splash this on there. Yep. Perfect. So you grab the bucket by the 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 handle. You grab it by the base and you just dump this water in. Um, and almost as luck would have it, you sort of reel back and a wave hits, filling that bucket again, and you are able to dump it a second time. Yes. What you notice is though the fire goes out, all of your water seems to sink below deck because where that fire was, there is a hole about the size of a dinner plate because this fire had some kind of what you might assume to be acidic properties and seemed to melt through the hull of this ship. So now there is water. Yeah. So now there is water (laughs) just seeping into the hull of this ship and you see that there are four more green flames across this boat. Um, Wylock, you see all of this. Your stomach turns and flops as the boat does the same, what do you do? Are you able to assist, or are you too sick? Uh, so witnessing, I've, I've gone through round two, so so witnessing what they've both gone through, and I can see the hole in the deck, right? Yeah, you can. Okay, so that really freaks me out, and I'm going to, I try and make my way over and, uh, and uh, use, uh, I'd like to use hedge magic again. Okay. To repair or mend a broken object. This is only the size of a dinner plate? Yep. Okay, so would that apply? Um, let me double check what your hedge magic does, just for my own edification here. So let's go to uh, Wylock, just so I know exactly what you can do. I believe so. Uh, clean a small, mend a broken object. Okay, so yeah. So here's my thoughts on that. The object isn't broken. There is a hole melted in it. So to fix a broken object, you need all the pieces. The pieces are gone. So okay, you so could you could find wood somewhere and mend it to it if you could find the wood to do so or whatever you think this ship's made out of if it is indeed wood. Okay. Um, all right. So look, if that we'll scratch that then. What I'd like to do is just look at the fires and study them and try and ascertain if the fires themselves are Numenera. Given my uh, I have uh, specialty specialization in identifying or understanding Numenera. Roll me a Numenera check. Uh, It will be a difficulty five. Uh, You just click difficulty five and it will automatically calculate your specialization for you. Okay, so click this, difficulty five. Um, Can I use effort again? You can. Yeah, I'll use a low point of level of effort. Yep, you can use effort on every single roll. Uh, You just can't exceed the maximum amount of effort you can spend per roll. Success. Uh, You look at these different kinds of uh, flames and you are, again, you have that moment of clarity. This is 100% some kind of Numenera. In fact, based on what you side eye observed through heaves over the side of this boat, uh, everything you just watched was some kind of interaction of Numenera. It's not often that you see it, but you have seen it where two different kinds of Numenera interact and have negative effects. Uh, It's even more rare that you've seen them have incredibly negative effects. This seems to be somewhere in the middle. Whatever is in this storm has something to do with Numenera. And the lightning that came out of it is a byproduct of that. And the fact that it hit this clearly Numenera ship, it interacted very differently than maybe if it had hit a a normal vessel. Uh, And this is absolutely some kind of Numenera interaction, some kind of chemical reaction. So no, but no detail about 
like the most effective way to extinguish them or anything like that? Uh, it seems as though water was effective on the green flames. It did, however, burn. And it seems like as long as the flames is burning, the flames are burning, uh, the more, the larger the hole is going to get, as if this was like a chemical reaction of acid just sort of going. Uh, you haven't really seen anyone interact with the other ones because your back was turned. Uh, so you don't really know the chemical properties of what they are. You just know that you can, you can guess by what's happening that each one of these has some kind of different property. Um, water seems to be effective currently uh, when applied in massive quantities. So a splash from a wave, a bucket or two, the rain doesn't seem to be dying these down. Um, and as you look to your right, uh, you can see that the footprints of blue fire clearly stomping that one out didn't seem to go in Zarev's favor. Um, so you know that probably jumping inside the fire is not an effective method of putting it out. All right, so I just, I yell out, follow her lead to everybody to douse them. Okay, perfect. Uh, I bow. <laughs> just sort of elegantly, <laughs> um, as you hand the bucket to someone else who need that's their business to do that. Um, <laughs> perfect. Ari, you have come down from the helm. Uh, I assume you were helping the cruisemen in some way. You see all of these fires. You see Zarev is walking towards you. Uh, blue flame footprints are, are streaking behind him. Um, you see that, that Silica has grabbed a bucket of water and been able to douse the green flame. Uh, what are you doing? Are you running towards one of the flames? Are you wanting to see what's happening? What, what exactly are you doing on this ship right now? Uh, can I grab a bucket as well? Sure. And like try to try to um, run over to uh, Zareph and, and say, I'm going to throw the water on you. So get your feet ready and I'm going to throw a bucket of water on his feet. Okay. So you do. You douse his boots in water, and if they weren't sopping wet before, they absolutely are now. Uh, but what you do is you see these small amounts of blue flame that have been licking up around his boot fade out, uh, and he's no longer uh, having those footprints as he retrieves his cloak. Uh, Zara, if you do retrieve your cloak, uh, Ari, you are easily able to, if you so choose, tie off this bucket and drag it behind you through the water to refill it uh, in some yeah, manner. Um, and the two of you, I assume, charge back towards these fires, which are slowly beginning to spread um, as more lightning streaks through the sky as you would appear to be entering the hardest part of the storm, the heaviest rainfall, uh, and there are more lightning strikes. And as they streak across the sky, almost brightening it up like daylight, you see a big green strike of lightning, a blue strike of lightning, and you can see more of that intercloud lightning sort of roiling through the, the clouds themselves, almost almost giving them a backlit kind of presence. Uh, which... Uh, which which fire do you go to, Ari? Which color? And Zarev, which one do you throw your cloak over? Um, well, can I ring it out over, sure. to, like you know, uh, a green one? Since I'm gonna, you know, have seen the success of what the others have been doing. Absolutely. So you immediately run to the closest green one. You sort of ball it up and you ring this thing out and the rain floods down over the top of it and it washes out most of it. Uh, and you can see that there is like just the small flames licking at the edge of this hole that is now probably about, I don't know, 10 inches across uh, that has melted through the deck of this ship. You're easily able to, you know, get out those last sprinkles of water on the little small tongues of this flame uh, and put that out. Uh, and now you have a mostly dry uh, cloak. Where do you throw the cloak? Um, I'll put it back on for the moment. Okay, perfect. So you, I'd rather rather not have it uh, have it burn. That's fair. Eventually, uh, this, that that cursed sun's gonna come back out. Yeah, and then drive everything. So you throw the cloak back on. Uh, it sinks heavy on your shoulders. This is a like likely some kind of woolen cloak, as it is now Dallas with water. Um, Ari, you see another one of the green flames go out, as you now can see the massive hole. This this ten inch diameter hole that was left behind its residue. Uh, you you can kind of get some of the properties of the blue that you can see based on the footprints that he obviously stepped in it and that had no avail which flame do you run to and how do you uh how do you deal with it so the water that i put on his feet mm -hmm. um sorry my wife walked in and i totally got distracted that's okay um so what happened with the the water on the blue flame at his feet uh so for for sake of uh of, of success i'm gonna say that you threw it in a way that kind of washed him uh washed the water over the side excuse me of the deck um, uh -huh. So when, as soon as you threw the water at his boot, you saw the water actually carry the fire over the side of the boat and into the water. And if you watched behind, you would see little tongues of flame sort of floating back behind the ship. 
So I think I'll go to the next pile of blue flame and try to do that same thing and try okay. to see if I can wash it overboard. Sure. So you're going to angle it towards the water. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So you do so. You sort of grab the bucket. You drag the bucket behind you with a rope. You sort of heave it up over the top and you sort of splash this this bucket of water and you see it carry and begin to flow across the deck. Um, and and like when, when water you know slides down a surface, there's those streaks that leave behind and you can tell there's some little streaks of flame that is from this, this larger fire that are left behind. Behind. It may take a few heaves of this bucket okay. to fully get this off there, but you've got it under control and you are able to douse one of the blue flames. Uh, the uh, the the areas where there used to be blue flame, mm -hmm. is there any marring of the ship? It is completely bone dry and does not seem to be getting wet again. Hmm. We should keep some of that around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need to blue fire treat our ship. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so there, that's that's what you see. There is there is a completely dry spot, almost as if you did, um, I don't know, what is that stuff you put on decks that keeps it dry? That stuff, uh, deck sealant. Car? Deck sealant. Uh, uh, so there's like that, as if the like someone took a blow dryer and dried that one stuff spot. On your on the clothing. Yeah, that so stuff I'm, basically. All right, so when it comes back to my turn, I'm going to throw my cloak over the uh, <laughs> over the blue flame. Okay, cool. So we'll go over to uh, we'll go over to Silica right now. Silica, you have. Have you given your bucket to someone else? Because it's, you know, oh, someone yeah. else's job, obviously. Um, so you see that there are still flames running across this ship. Uh, more green flame has been put out. Uh, you have handed your bucket off because that's that's someone beneath you's job. What are you doing to put these flames out? Or are you? Uh, so I don't want to have anything to do with that green flame. Mm -hmm. Green flame. Yeah, Sorry, I had go. to. Yep. I mean, it, I, you guys were all doing it anyway, so I had to. Uh, <laughs> but that stuff is scary, nasty. So I don't want. I don't want to be anywhere near that. I saw what happened to Blue Flame, but we still need to do some sort of problem-solving exercise with Purple Flame. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna grab probably another bucket, that different one that I passed off that's near Purple Flame, and try to douse it with water and see what happens. Okay. Um... As soon as you take this this bucket of water and douse it with this this purple flame, I need you to roll me a speed defense check. Uh, it is a DC or a, a difficulty rating five. And I can Ooh. use I can use my shield though, because I I have the speed defense. Is your shield out? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of question is that? Well, I mean, you like need a, you need two like hands. Question. You need two hands to throw that bucket of water. No, so how are you holding that shield? You know what? You're a smart man. I'm not holding the shield. <laughs> Dang it! <laughs> uh, you can spend effort to lower that. Right. So, so this would be a speed check then. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, speed check. If you don't have speed defense actually on there, speed check just works fine, and it would be a difficulty five. Uh, and if you'd like to spend effort, you can reduce your uh, speed pool by three. Gosh. I roll so poorly. So poorly I roll. Oh. Okay. The dice tell the story. Yeah, they do. Uh, how, you know, how bad can it be? It can't be that bad. Ooh. Cool. So you take this water uh, and you begin to throw it across this blue, uh, sorry, this purple flame. And mm -hmm. it is just too late that you realize that as soon as the water is is not even fully out of the bucket and hits the very top of these tongues of blue flame that some kind of reaction happens and like the lightning in the sky you see lightning arc back through the water and hit hit the metal bucket in your hand as you are forced to throw the bucket down and you take one point of might damage as you are electrocuted from whatever the hell this purple flame is Great. It seems as though the water had no effect on it. And uh, so the, I just take my might current value down. Yeah, you take your might pool down by one. Okay. Yep. Oh, the pool. Yeah, the whole pool. Uh, gotcha. Yep. Um, Wylock, you have done some Numenera investigation. You understand kind of what's happening here, or at least how the flames were produced. You've seen the chemical reactions thus far that everyone has tried. What are you doing? Is there a concentration of the purple flames in particular? Uh, it, seem, it seems as far as you can tell that they're kind of scattered across. There are two that are closer together than the other ones, uh, if you'd like to try to get them together in some way. What I want to do is look at... I, I'm, I'm looking in my cloak and thinking about... Thinking about... 
yep, I'm going to do it. So I pull out um, this device that I have that I know creates a flame retardant wall. Okay. Uh, so it creates a plane of energy 20 feet by 20 feet mm -hmm. for one hour. Flames passing through it are extinguished. So I would like to lay it down to cover as much area as, um, as much fires as possible, wherever the most concentration of the fires are, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah. So this boat isn't 20 feet wide, so you could absolutely lay it across the entire boat, and you're pretty sure you can get all of the remaining flames in there. So you're going to spend your cipher uh, to activate this uh, flame-resistant wall, I believe. Um, yeah. So describe to me what this looks like, how you activate it, and what it looks like as it douses these flames. Uh, well, the thing I pull out of my cloak is uh, it's like a, a cube, three-inch squared, uh, each side has like a, a yellow to red radiant on mm -hmm. it, and it's different, so the colors don't meet on any side. Um, and light doesn't seem to affect it. It's like it's that color no matter what. If it were in pitch black, it would look this, the same. So <clears throat> I pull it out and I yell, get down! I push a button that's on one side, throw it, and it bursts and lays down this, uh, this plane of energy down on the deck. Okay, yeah, cool. I imagine it's like the uh, the old school uh, GameCube kind of thing. Yeah. So it hits and then begins to unravel, and then all the different squares begin to extend until it is it is exactly twenty by twenty, and it spreads across the deck. And it, as it spreads, everyone kind of jumps out of the way, not sure if this is going to trap them into the deck or somehow affect them in their mobility. As it sort of around this deck, and you see all of the flames douse. And as this yellow to red, uh, it kept the same color uh, as it was when it was a cube, but it's now it's spread across a 20 by 20 space, um, or at least to the edges of the boat, because it takes up this, whatever space it can fill, right? Um, you now see that there are four holes of varying size in the hull of this ship um, that are that will take on water as soon as this uh, is, is removed. And how long does this flame retardant wall last? It uh, lasts one hour, and I actually, well, I just deleted it, but I think it just prevents fire from going through it. I don't know if it's okay. like a, an, an actual energy, like an impermeable field. Okay, so it seems to be just fire resistant. Okay, so you see that this thing loads over the, the over the top of the, the boat here. You can all see through this, this yellow to, to red gradient, right, that there are four holes. Um, you see trapped underneath it, where the purple flame was, there is dancing, like, electricity and lightning. Wylock, you're pretty sure, uh, although you can't really tell with the lucidity of your mind currently, you're, you're pretty sure that uh, this will dissipate as soon as you remove the shield. Uh, but for now, it seems to be trapped under their, like, mercury in a bag kind of situation. Um, but you can see through this yellow to red gradient that there are... Uh, like the small dinner plate size hole, there's the 10 inch wide hole, and the other two green flames are now 15 to 20 inches uh, as they are just taking in water um, as the waves splash over and more lightning crackles through the sky. Um, you look around you as this thing kind of shimmers into life having done its job, everyone sort of looks to you, there's a quick ah, there's a quick cheer as more lightning scatters through the clouds, and you can see that where this lightning forked and hit the sails, that it is now flapping in this tumultuous wind, and you hear as it sounds like metal grinding on metal, as you see that these, these sails are rubbing against each other, and the tear is getting wider and wider as more and more of the sail goes dark. What are you guys doing? Did you see that the, the inside of that egg looked like it was the same material, or just mm -hmm. that it was blue? It looked like it might have been the same material. Okay, so, um, so I remember that and pull it out and try and I, I start to try and put two and two together as to how I might uh, use this. Okay, uh, roll me a Numenera check. All right. We'll call it, uh, we'll call it, we'll, we'll go with the same. We'll call it with a, a difficulty five. Five, okay. Uh, I won't use effort this time. So you are looking at this thing, and despite looking up at this, you know, you've never actually climbed the sails to confirm this is the same thing, but going on your hypothesis that this is the same material, you look down at the bag of, of smashed pieces of an egg, right? And you know that even if you could fashion this into some way to save that sail, 
with the speed in which it's tearing and how much is currently already torn, there's no way you have enough material to be able to repair that entire thing. You're pretty sure you can repair some of it if this is the right material. Uh, if it's not the right material, you can at least patch the hole, but it, you don't think it's going to reactivate. Um, whatever reason it went from blue to black, um, or yeah, uh, you, you don't think it's going to... If, if it's not the same material, it's definitely not going to repair it, but you can at least patch the damages. But based on what you can see, there's not enough in there to get the whole thing. All right, so I lock up for a moment in thought and kind of just stew on this for a little while. Yep, still looking in the bag, looking up, looking in the bag. Uh, so you all see him kind of lock, like you see him impressively deploy some crazy Numenera device that saves the day uh, and then immediately start. So is there, silence. is the, is the, the, ma uh, the, the sail, is that on fire or is it No, just... it seems where the lightning hit the sail, something happened. And when the lightning streaked through the sail, uh, don't think of it as like a, an actual fabric sail, like an actual, you know, modern day sailing vessel, right? Um, think of it as th this is some kind of Numenaren thing, whatever this sail is. So that when the lightning hit it, it actually coursed through it as if this was some kind of like plasma screen, right? Um, and once the lightning hit the end of it, it scattered out and made all this fire. But where the lightning traced through, it began to rip. And wherever the lightning touched, it's now black instead of the bright blue that the sails used to be. Is it still held up by rigging? Is it still... Oh, it's still held by rigging. Yeah, there seems to be a split down the middle of the sail. Like as if someone took a knife and, you know, did the whole pirate thing uh, down the center of it. It's still held in place here. It's just slowly peeling apart in the center. Um, can I determine whether or not the, the rigging is actually causing like the fact that it's being held up there mm -hmm. is that is that helping or or hurting the the scenario so because you have uh training in sailing right and because you've been talking with the sailors and learning on your journey you know that the tautness of the uh sails is definitely not helping the matter if you reduce the sails down you know that obviously if there's no tension it won't tear anymore Right. Then, I, um, then, then I'm gonna just I'm gonna. But you, you know, also know that if you reduce the tension, you're not gonna sail anywhere, and you'll be in the middle of a storm with no sails. But if we don't fix the sail, we're gonna be in the middle of a storm mm -hmm. without the ability to go anywhere anyway. Perfect. I'd, I'd rather I'd rather drop the sail so that we don't have any further damage. We can fix it and be able to to deal with it later. They throw me overboard, they throw, throw me overboard, but that's what I'm going to do. Perfect. And how are you going to do this? Are you just going to rush up there, kick the flywheel, and, and drop the sails as best you can before anyone can stop you? Uh, I'm going to say we need, to, we need to drop the sails before it gets further further damaged and see if that's going to convince anyone else to, to, to assist me. But if not, I'll do it all myself. Uh, so as soon as you begin to bark this out, uh, you were near, I believe you were near the bosun mate, uh, bosun Dorisha. Uh, you begin to shout this out and, you know, next of command on this side of the boat, uh, he walks over to you, like I said, big burly barrel chested man, uh, strange tattoos. And as soon as he walks over, you see the tattoos actually move and they must be some kind of strange Numenera and ink. Uh, he walks over to you um, and you see that similar almost to Ari uh, on the back side of his arms underneath his shirt. You see that there is these strange metal protrusions coming out from his back, uh, seemingly augmenting his, his muscular strength. Um, and he looks over to you and he says, this is ridiculous. That will stop the boat dead. We can't reduce the sails. We have to push forward. We'll be dead in the water. We'll be dead in the water if we don't get these sails down. They'll, 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 be, they'll be destroyed. Look at that. Uh, he looks over and he says, uh, Giorgio, Sharon, up, fix it. Uh, and you see two of the uh, two of the, the the crewmen sort of stop whatever they're doing. They nod off the ropes and they begin to climb the rigging, much the same way you were. And you see them start to make their way across the sails slowly as the the boat sort of pitches. One of them's foot slips off the edge. He quickly grabs back on, uh, and it seems as though the bosun wants to try to repair this uh, and isn't keen to let you snap that line and drop the sails. Do you do it anyway? Absolutely. Okay. As long as, long as it's not going to pitch those two guys, you know, down, you know, out into the water. Mm -hmm. Nope. Uh, it seems as though even if even if it does affect them in any way, that there is enough rigging that they'll either fall into it or be able to grab onto it. They're not over the water. This tear seems to be closer to the mast than it is uh, to the, to the edge of the boat. Um, so you kind of push past this guy. Um, 
Roll me a speed uh, defense. If you don't have speed defense, just speed. Uh, and we'll call it a speed defense three. All right. Um, as, he, as he sees you, and he's going to try to grab you to stop you from doing it. Where, Where is speed defense? If he's not on there, just roll speed. Same uh, thing. I ha- I, I'm trained in speed defense. Okay, so then if you would, uh, you would have to add it to your speed skills. Okay. Um, if not, just do, a, uh, just do a speed defense and give yourself one asset. We'll call it an asset for now. We can fix that in post. All right, what is the difficulty? Uh, three. Three. I will apply effort. I don't see where to... Where and do I add the effort? Uh, it should say once you click uh, roll, it should say effort, and then you put, put one down, and then it should say asset, and for right now we'll call it one asset because you're trained in it. Uh, while he is doing that, uh, Ari, what are you doing? Oh, so I don't see where where it uh, where it shows up. Uh, okay, so it's on the uh, it's on the roll twenty. So you needed to roll a three. Uh, sorry, you you needed to roll a nine. You rolled a one, uh, which means I get a free GM intrusion. Now a GM okay. intrusion is a thing well, that I can fun. yes. It's a new fun that you get, new fun thing you guys get to learn. A GM intrusion is something that I can inject into the game anytime I feel like it. When I do it, I give one XP to the person I'm injecting it on, and then one XP to that person to give to someone else. When you roll a nat one, I get one for free. Um, it's essentially the, the new mechanic for fumble, right? Uh, so you begin to run over the bosun no he sees exact he sees that flash in your eye that oh fuck you i'm doing this anyway this is the right <laughs> move and he immediately puts an arm out and sort of racks and clotheslines you and as you are slipping on the deck of this boat hitting his beefy mechanized arm uh, as you're slipping back you look up to the mast and you see that the first you think it might be Giorgio, you're not sure, as he sort of shimmies across this thing uh, and he grabs one side of the uh, sail uh, and you see him reach and grab the other side of the sail and begin to slowly pull. You see at the last second, he closes a circuit and you see blue light hit his hand and then he is illuminated in blue as it hits the other side of this thing and he is thrown back 20 feet towards the back of this boat and he smashes into the doors that would be the captain's quarters uh, and you see that his eyes are wide open and glowing blue and his body is a smoking husk. Uh, The other person on there stops moving immediately and looks back down to the bosun mate uh, who looks at you, looks up, looks at the flywheel and smashes the flywheel and drops both of those sails. Not sure what the hell that was that did that. Um, but whatever you wanted to happen, happened. Just not exactly the way you planned for it. Uh, so as you look up from your back, uh, we'll so go back l- over. Go ahead. L- lying, lying on my back, I will stare up at, at Derisha and say, that man's death is on you. <laughs> You see that you see that moment of recognition of the that that oh I know I fucked up kind of look and he quickly turns leaving you where you are uh, and you 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 feel a new gravity in his voice as he begins directing people um, and he looks he looks over to the other person now clearly identified by the shout Sharon get down uh, as he shouts to the other person uh, to clamber back down um, and no one seems to look at or approach the corpse um, that is now at the back of the boat. Uh, I, I, I absolutely make, make my way over to him. Cool. So you scramble up, slipping on the dock, uh, slipping on the deck as you sort of make your way over there. Uh, Ari, what are you doing? That's a good question. Are there any sails still up or they're all down? Uh, you see that the main sail is down. There are still smaller sails, uh, but you know that judging by the amount of time you spent on this boat, uh, you've cut your speed in at least half. And those sails are also hurt. And just the mainsail was hurt. Oh, just the mainsail was yep. hurt. Okay. Um, 
geez, I think I'll walk over to this guy because I saw him just like fly across the ship. Cool. And I'll try the uh, the Ari maneuver as we are going to start calling it, where I put my hand on his chest and see if I can fix him. Okay, cool. Uh, so as you sort of make, you, you see Zareph walking that way and you start to move that way too, you both kind of get there at the same time and Zareph, you see Ari reaching his hand out towards this guy. You have a moment to stop him if you so choose. If not, he's going to make contact and attempt to bring this guy back to life in the same way he did before. I'm not so sure that body's safe. Well, we can't let him just die. You can you can try, but be be warned. I think there might be something in that storm still on still in him. And I put my hand on his chest. Which hand? The metallic one. Cool. Uh, the moment you press your hand to his chest, you feel some kind of energy course through your body. This feels like the day you first touched whatever that Numenaran metal vein was, uh, mm -hmm. and you felt that infection rise across your body, and you see this blue light begin to flow through the different mechanical parts um, and, and kind of fuse with you. And on your shoulder, you see this symbol blaze in blue, uh, almost so bright you have to look away, and you feel it searing, which is strange because you don't really have feeling in this metal arm, but you feel this pain as if someone put a hot poker to your uh, arm. And Wylock, you recognize this symbol. It is the only symbol that sticks in your brain from the time you touched whatever it was that you touched and sort of got that dot in your head. Um, you don't know what this symbol is. You're not really sure why you know what it is, but you do. Uh, and as you sort of turn, the flare kind of draws you to it. Zareph, you also recognize this symbol. Okay. From the, uh, the, the moment that you touched a strange device, you can't picture what the device is anymore, but the symbol that was etched on the device is the exact same symbol that is now flaring to life on Ari's arm. And what does the symbol look like? You tell me. It's whatever symbol that you touch the device that made you avert to the sun and uh, lose, lose the light in your exploration, uh, your, your exploratory nature. Um, so it, it kind of looks like a, uh, a, a pixelated sun. So like, as opposed to having, you know, the wave, wavy lines, mm -hmm. they're all, they're all in like blocks and they're, they're, they're different gradients. Mm -hmm. So like you, you can, you can see that that's kind of what the design is, but it's not the, the, the fluid natural that you would expect from something like that. And you see this symbol in bright blue, the similar blue that you recall from the, the sails and exactly the same blue that you saw just shoot through that man and fry him. They kind of like that. Perfect. Um, you <laughs> see that luck. symbol blaze to life on his, the cap of his shoulder. Um, and as you're kind of looking in shock at this, you see out of the corner of your eye, almost the exact same face you assume you're making. I assume coming out of Wylock. Wylock, what are you doing? Um, well, like you said, it caught my attention, and so I'm just sort of awkwardly shuffling over to get a better look. Okay. Uh, Silica, you see that all of your allies have, ga have, have kind of gathered around this corpse uh, and seem to be looking at Ari and the bright blue shining symbol coming out of his arm. Do you go over there with him? I mean, I'm, I'm still kind of reeling from getting electrified by fire. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> You know. you know, that's just every other day. It's just, yeah. yeah, that happens. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but th this is even weirder than getting electrified by fire. So I do head over to see kind of what the hubbub is and why they've stopped working. I'm okay. like, okay, okay, boys, like, let's get back to it. What are you wasting your time for? Like, this man is beyond our help. We can't help him. So I, I am curious as to why they've stopped. Perfect. So you kind of come over there in your natural bossy tone um, and you you kind of go over there to see this. And as you see past like the, the crowd of, of, the, of the men standing there, you see that this bright blue light is slowly beginning to fade. And Ari, this searing pain is beginning to leave your shoulder and it now feels like that same, that same normal, if you can call it that, metallic sensation. But the symbol is still there. 
Uh, in fact, whatever wires and fibers were once making up your shoulder is now a solid piece of metal. And that symbol is on it, almost like a tattoo. And the pain subsided? The pain does subside. Um, I turn to the rest of them and I say, I believe this man is beyond our help. Are you okay? And I do kind of a, like this, maybe a quick like one-two punch. Mm -hmm. Any any differences? No, nope, it my... feels completely normal. You just now have a sweet tattoo. I feel fine. But I've got this sweet tattoo that Ted gave me, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I believe that was Giorgio. Yeah. <laughs> um, so is the is the guy, you know, completely toast? Is he fried? So as is you look, glowing blue? as you look back from from Ari's arm back to this guy, you see that the blue light has subsided. Uh, in fact, Zaref, if you're if you were paying close enough attention, you would have seen that as soon as his hand touched him, the blue glow faded and seemed to transfer to Ari. Um, and yeah, that's that's probably all you would notice. Um, but this guy seems to be. Um, I think you know what, Zaref. I think you might have seen this kind of situation before uh, in one of your exploratory sessions. Um, I'm sure you've had allies before, um, and not all of them make it out alive in the exploration business, especially with Strange Numenera. This man is a husk. Uh, and in fact, now that the lights have left his eyes, you can see that there's nothing behind them. Like, he is, he seems to be hollowed out from the inside, that with enough pressure applied to this guy, he could probably just poof, into dust. So try, trying to, you know, remember some of the emotion I used to used to feel. Yeah, I'm 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 trying to 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 well up and you know give this guy something more than what what I'm able. But you know, with a, just a, a flat tone, I, I look look at the body, say I'm sorry, and I head back to head back to do whatever I can for the ship. Cool. So you say your you say your goodbyes to this this Giorgio who gave his life for the albatross, um, and you as you see uh, it is it is in fact easier for this husk to draw a well of tears than it is for you as you see the cavities of his eyes slowly begin to fill up with the rainwater and begin pouring down his face um, as you stand and sort of turn suddenly back to the rest of the crew. Wylock, you see this happening. You saw Zara's reaction. Ari, you're still standing there. So, like, you clearly see that this was something slightly more than just, let's go check on this corpse. Um, what are the three of you guys doing as Zaref begins to walk away? I've got some, uh, I pull out my journal type of thing, mm -hmm. parchment, uh, and I'm sort of messing with Ari's arm, and I'm just recording the symbol, saying... It's just in case we, uh, don't worry about it. I just like to draw. <laughs> so like a backup of the symbol. So like an intrusive doctor, he begins to jostle you around as you begin to yeah. rise. Um, just recording the symbol for yeah. future use. Uh, so yeah, you're able to easily jot that down in your notes. Um, Silica, what are you doing in this situation right now? I'm just happy they're getting back to work. So I'm starting to think, you know, okay, what's the next step in this whole process? We have, we're, we're losing headway because our main sails down mm -hmm. and damaged. We're we have a time limit on how long this fire retardant flubber or whatever it is is going to last. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, you know, looking towards the first mate, the bosun, the captain, looking for direction on okay, what what do we do next? Okay, so because you're a very personable young lass, uh, go ahead and roll me your ability to charm. Uh, this is, for lack of better terms, this is like an insight roll to see what kind of vibe you get from the bosun, the first mate, and the captain. Uh, and we'll call it a uh, difficulty three. So, being positive and pleasant in all social interactions, mm -hmm. uh, what is that under intellect? Or uh, yes, I, I yes, that would be under like, intellect. Okay. But That's in fact, if you see where it says positive, I think if you look on your character sheet where it says positive, that should be under intellect, is it not? I, I don't have one. I, I don't have a. Yeah, I know. I'm looking for it, but I don't see it. So um, unless I'm missing it. That's all right. We'll we'll add that in there. So go ahead and roll uh roll intellect, uh, and then just add one asset for your training. Okay, and difficulty three. Uh, difficulty three, yes. Okay. Yay. Perfect. There you go. Now it's on your character sheet. All set. 
So, oh, I thought that was another GM fail. Oh. I scrolled up a second and I, I panicked for you all. Oh, oh. I, I panicked for all of you. Uh, so the good news is you succeed. The bad news is what you find out. Uh, as you look back and forth to the bosun, the first mate, and especially the captain, uh, you get the impression, and you've seen this before because, you know, you're brazen and you seem to talk down to people, uh, and you've seen them fear your father and his associates. These guys have no idea what they're doing. They're, oh. they're well-to-do sailors. They know how to craft, they know how to, 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 to move this vessel where it needs to go. This is like, this, you get the impression that this is unlike anything they've ever been through. And they are winging it as much as you guys are. This storm seems completely unnatural. Uh, and you've kind of put that together. You've, you've never seen a storm like this, right? Um, and their, the look on their faces uh, confirms that they haven't either. Uh, and their, their best guess is likely only slightly better than yours because they know how to pilot a ship. Uh, so that's, that's the inference you get by looking at all... They all have a similar face, although Bosun Darisha looks a little bit more stern, uh, having been uh, berated by Zarif at the death of, uh, of Giorgio. Uh, but they all look like they're hoping that the storm breaks. That, that seems to be your best solution, is that this storm goes away, and no one seems to know how to make that happen. They're just pushing through. All right, so, so my natural tendency would be to go into command mode here. Sure. So I would say, Wylock, Zeref, get on that sail, fix that problem. I want Ari with me. I'm going back to the helmsman because he's got some eyeball Numenera insight that I want to make sure we're still on the right heading of wherever they thought we were supposed to be going and, and, and try to do a little bit of damage control there. Mm -hmm. So the same woman who brazenly dove into the water to save a uh, random crewman number one's life uh, has now demanded that the three of you go about whatever business she has dictated to you and then storms off towards the captain, uh, leaving Wylock, Ari, and the pacing away Zarif uh, to either do or not do her bidding. What are the three of I you guys I want do? Ari. I want Ari with me. Okay. So, yeah, Ari, yeah, you I get... I follow. I'm like, yes, ma'am. Sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you recognize the authority that any, yep. any down-home mining community guy should... Uh, Wylock and Zaref, you're left sort of standing there. Zaref, you were already off to do something. Uh, what are you doing now? Uh, I'm going to go take a look at the at the sail now that it's down. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm used to seeing things that are weird. It's kind of, you know, I'm not I'm not a specialist at it, but I'm 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 good at searching. I'm good at figuring things out. Uh, so I want to examine this sail and see what information I can find out from it, see if there's a, a, maybe not a way to fix it, but to see what happened mm -hmm. so that I can, I, I can be able to get somebody else to repair. Clearly you don't set out to sail without somebody who's got the ability to fix your ship. Okay. But if I can figure out what's wrong, maybe that guy can fix it. Perfect. And I follow Zeref to help him out. Okay, cool. Uh, so you I, begin... I take this as really good signs, like, oh, yeah, they're listening to me. <laughs> that they're finally doing what you said? Uh, Even if they're not actually listening to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we'll follow you two over there. Uh, Zaref, the, the rigging has dropped, and now the, the, the sail is, is still up in the air, but it's, it's condensed down. So with the two of you combined, uh, Zaref, you're able to help Wylock up the rigging, to this thing, but while like, there is no other way for you to look at the sail without being up there. You can look at it from the bottom and see it 10, 15 feet in the air, uh, but there's no way for you to get a closer look at this unless Zaref helps you climb up there. Um, so if you're so comfortable I'll, I'll take with that... A, take a look at him. Does, mm -hmm. um, does, does he look like someone who's not going to be able to do this? Wylock? Do you look, look like, like someone, who... someone who's probably not going to be able to do this? <laughs> All right, so I, I reach into my reach into my bag, and I have uh, I have a pair of a pair of gloves that have uh, it looks like adhesive or something you know mm -hmm. something on them, uh, and I, I hand, hand them to you and say you you won't be able to to to, to fall, and I hand him uh, my ah. you hand him your isotoners. Uh, I hand him my. Uh, my adhesive gloves. Mm -hmm. Come on, scroll. So you adhesive, get his cipher. Adhesive clamps. Yeah. So I'm giving him my, my cipher to be able to, to climb because I can climb without a problem. Sure. So, so you I think that. So you hand over the cipher. Uh, what do these clamps look like as you hand them over to him? 
as I, as I said, they're, they're like gloves with mm-hmm. adhesive on it. So like you just kind of stick and it kind of responds to your to your thoughts and will. So like when you want to let go, they, it does. Okay. When when you don't want to let go, you're stuck. Cool. So you Spider-Man it up these these things. Um, so I'm not going to have you roll for it, Zara. If you are an experienced climber, you get up there. You've been up there before several times. Uh, while like you now have these adhesive Spider-Man gloves and you are able to scramble up there, no matter how uncomfortable you are, it seems as no matter how many times your feet slips off the rigging, your hands boop, are stuck there and you're able to scramble and pull yourself back up and try it again. And make sure to yell out, why did we sign up for this? Yeah. <laughs> I was voluntold. Um, <laughs> uh, Beard Bear uh, donates $2 with a super chat and says, uh, Gilgan's Island theme song, the chat demands it. Uh, for episode two, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you guys get up there and you're going to begin looking at the Numenera. Uh, now, I assume, Wylock, you're going to be looking at it from a scientific Numenera standpoint, but Zaref, how are you going to be examining this, this Numenera? What's, what are you looking for here? Um, you know, oddities, things that, um, you know, th- things I've encountered before. Uh, clearly, if the, the, the Numenera that, you know, kind of gave, gave me some insight into the world, gave, gave me... You know the the setbacks of that god awful sun. Um, you know if if that's been affected through the sale through Giorgio and then transferred into Ari, this is clearly something I've experienced before. Okay. Okay. Cool. So with that, I'll have you roll me an intellect with one asset for your backstory. Okay. Uh, and Wylock, I assume you're using your knowledge of Numenera in general, right? Yes. Uh, so if that's all you're using, uh, go ahead and roll me an intellect uh, with that training. And this is a um, uh, difficulty five. All right. So I don't have an edge. Uh, is effort one? Uh, effort cost three. Effort cost three? Mm-hmm. All right. Um, uh, if you have yeah. edge, is that three reduced to two? Yes. Okay, so my pool should actually be 16. Okay. Yeah, anytime you, anytime you, so if you have uh, edge in something, anytime you would spend uh, from that pool, it's reduced by one. But the, the wonky bit for um, spending a pool is it's only reduced the first time. So you, if you're spending, so it, once you hit level two and you have two effort, if you use two effort, you reduce that by one at the beginning. So it wouldn't be... Uh, three Perfect. points, it'd be four points instead of instead of the normal five. Gotcha. Um, Wylock succeeds uh, and Zaref. All, right, uh, so, all right, so I'm going. Uh, I think this is important. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I I will apply effort. Uh, what is the difficulty? Uh, it is a difficulty five, and you have one asset from that uh, eloquent backstory you implied. All right. So roll. Hey, did those two XP get handed out, or is? Uh, so the XP from the uh, the intrusion uh, yeah. only happens when I decide to intrude. That was a nat oh, one, yeah. which means I get a free one. Killing a crew member wasn't an intrusion. Uh, that was the intrusion. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was he was the, he was the intrusion. Him closing the bridge on whatever this was was the intrusion. Uh, Wylock getting knocked on his ass was the failure. The intrusion was that guy getting killed. All right, so <laughs> did you see the roll show up? I did. You both have uh, mini crits. So, uh, Wylock, you have an immediate success with no special bonus. Um, and uh, Zer- uh, Zarif, you have a success with a minor effect. Okay, so from Zarif's perspective... You're looking at more of the interaction between Numenera and devices, a thing of which you have seen before. Um, without really conversing with Wylock, getting up close and personal with this thing, you are looking, I assume, without touching, based on exactly how you just saw one of them die, um, without touching this, maybe grabbing the pole and kind of lifting it as best you can to see yeah, this. I'm, um, I'm trying my best to not, not get a, a repeat performance. Right, right. You see that... Uh, the the wherever the lightning seems to have touched, 
Uh, holy crap. Uh, Monty Cook Games hits that super chat for $10 and says, great job, everyone. May your ciphers never malfunction. Uh, don't, don't wish that on them, Monty Cook. Uh, I want them all to malfunction. That's the point of the game. Uh, Monty Cook is awesome. <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you for enjoying the show. Uh, stick around. Uh, we have a good, uh, good 30 minutes left. Um, so you kind of lift up the bar and get a look at this. Wherever the lightning hit, or at least that's what you assume, definitely wherever the split is, uh, is black around this thing. And your best guess is that this entire sail is some sort of maybe self-powered new and Aaron device. You don't see it connecting to anything else except where it would normally connect to rigging, right? Um, but you see that wherever the lightning touch, wherever it's splitting, is slowly beginning to fade. And it's it's stretching further on the left-hand side. So the part that's connected all the, all the way across to the right-hand side of the ship uh, the longer side has more power and is, is blackening less. But the other side, the shorter side, is beginning to fully start to blacken. So it seems as though whatever the left side of this is, it's been severed from the power supply um, and is powering down. Uh, and is, Go ahead. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on that. Mm -hmm. Is, um, is the, le the left side, the port side, does that have less rigging attached? Uh, it is. It does, yeah, because it's, it's a smaller sheet of fabric, uh, so there is less rigging by definition being the smaller side of this. Can I get some more ropes connected? To... To, to the... Go ahead. I, like, if I, I imagine there, there's there's ropes here, yeah. and, like, that that's the power cable. Like, that, okay. that's the way, so, that's the sorry. way I'm looking let, let me Let me rephrase that. So all of the rigging along the top bar and the bottom bar is still connected. Uh, okay. This hasn't been severed from its connection to the boat. Okay. It has been right. severed from the other half of the sail. It seems as though the sail is self-powered by itself, and being severed, the smaller side is losing power faster than the larger side. Um, so whatever is creating the power supply, whatever is bridging this, uh, is, is, is dying on the left-hand side. As soon as you saw, having watched it really with the closest effect, as soon as you saw the guy touch the, Giorgio touch the blue side and the blue side, it seemed to connect a circuit. Um, mm, okay. so the fact that this is split seems to be creating that gap in the circuit. However, clearly Giorgio being a man of flesh, uh, was not enough power to make, to bridge that gap. Um, and you don't know that you have anything else um, unless there's a secret stash of uh, sails that you've seen below deck that no one knows about. Um, so far, you don't have a way to fix this. You can cut it away and, you know, get it out of there. You're not really sure what that's going to do except for maybe free it up. You might have um, enough fabric or tarp to rig up a, a, a manual, like an old school sail. But whatever the Numenera, whatever the speed that was getting you through the storm with this Numenera sail, um, you know that, that you're not going to be able to duplicate that. But it might get the sail up and running if you can replace it with, you know, an actual fabric tarp kind of uh, sail. Um, uh, so so I, I'll, I'll say to, to Wylock, you know, the, the whatever circuit, whatever powers this thing, it's, it's been... It's been disconnected. We we need to somehow join these two sides together so that the the it stops this transformation. All right, uh, and then I'm going to take another look at my oddity from earlier. Okay. Um, given the mini crit that I had, do I yep. have any new insight? Or sure. And, and now that also... this is the first time you've physically been up close with this thing. Um, yeah. Do you pull out the oddity? Yeah, yeah, I pull okay. it out, and I'm looking at it, trying to get some context here. Cool. So you pull out the oddity, and the moment you begin to open the bag and pull out a, a, a shard of this metallic egg fragment, uh, both you and Zareph see that the blue light, no, sorry, the blue webbing internal to the internal membrane of this of this egg begins to glow in a similar manner that the sails were glowing mere moments ago. Um, you know for a fact that this is the same material. Now that you have it up close, um, this seems to be a manufactured version of whatever this is. Um, and given your history and what you know that egg could be from, might be a reason for an assassination attempt. Say that last part again? The internals of this egg and where the egg came from. Right. The fact that the sail owned by the king of, uh, of Gon is made from the same material might be reason for an assassination attempt. This is clearly stolen octopi technology. Oh, okay. 
All right. Um, I take the, the chunk that I'm holding mm -hmm. and turn it upside down and try and hold it over the wounded part of the sail and just see if any, but I don't touch it. And okay. See if, <laughs> see if anything happens. Sure. Uh, with that, uh, that 18, um, since you've already mostly identified this kind of thing, you feel a vibration and a slight hum in your hand the closer you get it towards the actual sail itself. Okay, so no, I have no other insights on how to apply, possibly apply it, or... Uh... So, you feel it being pulled towards it. Uh, in fact, you have a slight moment of clarity, um, and it, it, it feels like almost a magnetic pull. But as you realize that, you kind of, the, the thought of what a magnetic pull is sort of fades from your mind. But you know that if you let go, this thing will zoop towards the sail. Okay, so I look over, Zareph, back up a sec. Okay. And then I go. <laughs> and as you let go, <laughs> as you let go, it sort of flies towards it and sort of, and it, it flattens out. Uh, and you see the silver metallic side, uh, like, calcify and turn black, almost like your friend Giorgio down there on the dock and begin to fall away. And you see that a new piece of uh, fabric has been added to this thing. It doesn't quite close the gap, but it is now an etch that, that existed where one didn't. Um, so without being able to close, literally close this gap and then like stitch it up with, with your egg pieces, you can put the egg on there and it seems to make a new piece. Um, you still have the problem where this is not enough egg to, uh, to get it to be f a full sale again. Uh, but with the two of you, with, the, with the, the amount of knowledge you guys have garnered in this situation, you think that you can get enough of the sale to maybe stop it ripping. Because at this point, it has severed the entire connection. So you think that you can probably patch up the top and the bottom to at least get power sort of cycling at at some capacity throughout the rest of the sale and hopefully stop the tear um, and get you guys back up to at least 75% speed. Uh, but right now you have no way to actually patch the entirety of the torn sail. Okay, so we use the rest of the chunks of the egg to, to, and distribute them evenly along the tear. Mm -hmm. So there's what, like three or five sites where there's a... Yeah, so a you're basically trying to make, you're just trying to make like several bridges across this gap, right? Like a, yeah. like a stitch almost. Yeah, um, best we can. Cool. So yeah, Zara, if you're kind of holding this up and, and sort of positioning this in a way that, that he's able to get to it without actually touching it as he with the egg pieces as it sort of splats on there and you see it calcify and fall away. So together you guys have made several band-aids on this hole and you're confident that unless struck by some kind of, you know, crazy lightning again, who would do that? Uh, it will hold um, enough that you guys can get the sail back up and start moving again. Oh. Uh. While it's still down, mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I have utterly disregarded Derisha. Uh, I'm not even gonna, not even gonna speak to speak to him. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am going to look for um, is it Captain Quarko. Yep, uh, he is at the helm where he has been the majority of the time, uh, shouting commands down to Derisha um, and the first mate. So, the. The sails have been at least partially repaired. Do we wish to do, do number one, do we have some other kind of sail that we would want to put up until we can get past the, the worst of this storm? Or do you wish to risk further damage to this sail and, and hoist it back up? You're talking to, have you, you climbed down and you're going to talk to the captain? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. Uh, so you uh, you get to the captain. So we'll we'll belay yours. You get to the captain, and Silica and Ari are currently there speaking to him and the helmsman. Uh, so we'll, we'll flash cut as you're as you've climbed down. You guys have made the band aids. You've helped Wylock down, and you're mo you're all moving your way towards the captain. Uh, Silica and Ari, what are you guys doing at the captain's uh, and, and the helmsman's position? I think I'm eyeing these holes in the ship, mm -hmm. and just kind of out of the corner of my eye going, that's probably going to be a problem. Um, is it a problem? Is it looking like a problem? It sure is. In fact, you, you've taken a minute to look at it, and you can see that the shield that, that Wylock has put over it, while amazing at stopping fire, does nothing to stop water. Uh, and you can see the water is cascading into these holes. 
Um, are there any barrels or anything around that I could break and use as wood to like hammer and kind of patch these holes? Sure. Okay. Then yeah. I kind of look at Silica and I'm like, I'm going to go patch some holes if she's cool with it, unless you needed me for something. <laughs> no, if you found a job, like that is a job that needs to be done. On it. And so I'm going to run over and uh, like raise a barrel across my head like Donkey Kong and just chuck it down and try to <laughs> break it into a bunch of larger pieces. And then I take those and jigsaw them as best I can with some hammer and nails and just try to plug up those holes. Okay, uh, so you are uh, excellent at smashing uh, mundane objects, so you don't have to roll for that. Um, what you can do is the first time you try to strike uh, a nail or some nail-like object into this wood and then through the deck of the boat, I need you to roll me a strength uh, DC3. Or a might, sorry, DC3. Been playing too much D&D. I know. Whoa. <laughs> cool. So you smash this nail through, and the moment it breaks through the wood and hits the actual deck, you realize quite fast that this deck is not, in fact, wood, and the amount of effort you have to exert is far more than you expected, but it eventually goes down in here. Um, and it feels like the, the, the closest comparison you can make, this is like back to your mining days where you're hitting yeah. a metal vein with a metal pickaxe. Um, this, this was like grinding this nail through, but you're able to get it through. And now that you have the, 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 the way it works kind of, the, now that you have the feel down, General you can easily sense. replicate that. Yeah. Um, so you begin to patch these holes to the best of your ability. Uh, Silica, that leaves you, uh, with the captain and the helmsman. So I think the first order of business is to get people bailing water mm -hmm. in the event that we can't get these holes patched fast enough. Like, Ari's working on it, but we don't know if that's going to be fast enough. Okay. So we need people down there bailing out water and then making sure with the helmsman that we are on course for wherever they thought we were going. Okay. So you're trying to take command of this situation uh, to the captain, I assume, on his own ship. Is that what I'm hearing? I mean, I had ascertained that the, the chain of command was in disarray. Okay. So... I feel comfortable enough with my upbringing mm -hmm. that I can bark out orders. And if that's not acceptable, the captain will stop me. I, like, I respect the chain of command, but if it looks broken, I'm going to fix it. Okay. So you're just sort of shouting this out before you even get to the captain. Right. Okay. So you begin shouting this out with the command and authority of someone befitting your station. Uh, and one or two people, just by sheer force of oral will, snaps to. And they're like, oh, shit, this lady's not fucking right. And they begin to, like, <laughs> find buckets. And, like, one of them, like, panics and sort of jumps down one of the holes that Ari's about to fix. Uh, and begins, like, sloshing water out of a porthole. Uh, the other guy panics and looks for the, the cargo stairs and looks for the bosun. And the bosun looks back at him with a scowl on his face and then sees you and just sort of nods. And he goes downstairs. Um, as you make your way to the uh, the captain, now you are standing atop the helm, uh, and you can you can hear the thump 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 of uh, someone walking up the stairs as Zaref is walking up behind you. Uh, but you have a brief few seconds to speak to the captain alone or the helmsman alone, if you so choose, before Zaref actually gets there. I, my first order of business is the helmsman. Okay, making sh making sure we're on whatever course they had set, that that's still. A viable plan. Okay, so you look down and you see that same Newman, this, this ocular Numenaran device, this this half circle uh, or half sphere uh, of some kind of translucent something with sort of metronomes and, and gadgets spinning and whirring like there are several compasses stacked on top of each other kind of going all over the place and as you go to look to ask him a question you see that his brow is furrowed and he's holding on to this and you can see that one of his eyes is the same exact ocular item that is on the the helm and it is also spinning in that same direction um judging by the consternation on his face you can tell that he has some kind of heading and he's he's moving towards that uh, but for a second, he looks at you with his other eye, uh, and he says, what, what can I do for you? As he pulls against the, the, the waves, uh, as he steadies the helm. Helmsman, are we on course? Uh, we're on whatever the hell course this thing tells me to go on. There's so, land so, somewhere this way. Okay, that's what I want to know. Well, that's, if you're not going to help, then get out of here. Talk to him. And he sort of reels against the waves. Uh, and you can see that the, the eye is freely orbital in his head, and it is moving um, 
think like Mad Eye Moody, just sort of going all yeah, over the place. Yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> um, and you see that whatever it is, there's a plane inside of it that always seems to be static, matching the the heading on whatever the hell that thing is on the actual helm. Uh, and as you go to turn, you see the captain uh, is looking down at a uh, very uh, angry-faced Zareph, I would assume, as he marches up the top of these stairs. And Zareph, you are face-to-face with the captain uh, atop his ship. Uh, not not so much angry. I, I tend to, as you know, as I said earlier, like I, I don't really express a lot of emotion. Right, right, right. Um, so like you know, ne- neutral, neutral with maybe a little bit of a a scowl mm-hmm. uh, as I as I come up the steps. Uh, so, uh, Captain, the the sails have been fixed as best they might with with what we have. Uh, so, I would ask, do we have any kind of temporary sails? Or do you want to put these ones back up in the height of this storm? He looks down to you, and he, he looks he looks to the repair job, and you can see that there's like a few breaks, and you can see Wylock struggling to get down as you kind of left him there. Um, and he looks to you and says, uh, "The helmsman he, he he told me that we're we're almost through as far as he could tell, whatever the hell that is. Um, he he thinks there's land on the other side of this. If, if the storm's not going to break." I don't know what this is. I've never seen anything like this before, but there's land out there, and the faster we get to it, the faster the faster we can be free of this, and the faster we can repair whatever the fuck this storm has done to the boat. Well, without more uh, Wylock's eggs, I don't see how we're gonna how we're gonna fix the sail any better than it is. I don't know what a breakfast item is going to do to help us with that, but we'll <laughs> approach that later. Uh, do you? That we have a we have a backup sail. It's it's a simple mundane cloth sail. It's not it's not going to get us out here fast. It will get us out, but if you think that the sail won't hold, you seem to be yeah. the only one that could have fixed it. You're the captain. I'm I'm just asking what what's your decision? Do we put up a different sail or do we risk risk the risk that one in the height of this? You see like that nervous look of like this is a weighty decision. Like this is one of those like we all die kind of decisions um and he looks to the helmsman uh and the helmsman is staring down at the the the, the orb there and his eye is spinning and it's spinning and he's fighting against the thing he looks over and he sees silico kind of turning and walking towards him and he says no raise the mainsail this will get us out here the fastest the cloth sail won't do uh it'll just get bogged down in whatever this is and if another lightning strike hits that it'll burn up immediately uh, raise the mainsail the faster we get out of here the better off we'll be so i i and you and, uh, head back down. Yep, head head back down. Uh, you know, and begin. Uh, you know, getting a couple uh, crewmen. Mm-hmm. Get the get the the mainsail hoisted. Grit, gritting my teeth, not uh, you know, what wondering whether this is a uh, this spells the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you get to the the mast as Wylock has finally gotten the way down. Uh, Wylock, if you hey, thought, just- go ahead. Yeah, just as I reach the bottom, there's a particularly loud thunderclap that sort of snaps my attention. And I'm looking at the sky and wondering, is there any sort of pattern I can discern where the lightning is striking? Anything I can look into the weather patterns and my knowledge of the nature of, the, of physics itself and everything that I might be able to give guidance so that we should go this way a little bit, mm-hmm. this way, and lessen our chances of hitting a bad wave or being struck again. Roll me Numenera uh, difficulty five. Uh, and okay. as you do that, Silica, you approach the captain who looks back to you as Zaref begins to walk down. Is there anything you wish to say to him? I want to know what his orders are. Oh, well, you just heard him say rig the mainsail. Uh, so basically, whatever the conversation was with Zaref, you overheard all of that. You're standing oh, right did. next to the guy. Yep. Okay, good. Jesus. Oh, <laughs> uh, you win this round. <laughs> uh, so what is it that you, yeah so you hear all of that so like you're you're mere feet away from him so you've heard his immediate instructions raise the mainsail the faster we got out of here the better if there is land on the other side at least that's what the helmsman tells him um, and you see Zaref make his way down there um, and as you kind of follow his trail you see that Wylock has perched himself in the middle of the deck and is looking up at the sky just staring as far as you can tell blankly at the clouds um, <laughs> what, what do your elf eyes see yeah so <laughs> We'll jump back over to Wylock as proverbial lightning hits him. Um, and you, there is absolutely a pattern. Um, the lightning strikes in the same color pattern. It is a purple lightning, a green lightning, a blue lightning. 
um, and they seem to be striking in concentric circles, each extending out from each other. So it'll be a close circle, a further out circle, a further out circle, and so on and so on until you can no longer see the storm. But they're always that purple, green, blue. Purple, green, blue. As it gets further and further out. Um, and the the colors sort of roiling in between the clouds, sort of giving it that backlit look. Um, it looks as almost as if normal sun coming through clouds. So these dark purple and blue storm clouds, right? Uh, it almost looks like a sunset kind of situation where this, this like bright orange globe is backlighting these things. So where you see the clouds meet, that seam between clouds, you see this bright orange kind of thing move and fade as the clouds kind of move against each other. Um, so you know that they strike... They move out, strike, move out, strike, move out, strike, and they seem to be going in a clockwise motion. So it seems as though this is or this, this storm is orbiting on some kind of axis and moving in concentric circles in some kind of order, um, further confirming your suspicions that this is in fact some kind of Numenera-driven storm. Okay, so so with the crit, I'll say I this is one of my. Uh... The cloud's clear, and I sort of have a moment of clarity. Mm -hmm. So I stroll confidently over to the helmsman and explain everything you just said. So make your header 20 degrees for 10 seconds and then adjust mm -hmm. so that we can avoid each rotation, as it were, and aim for the axis that, we, that, I, that I think it's rotating around. Cool. So you help him navigate the storm itself. He has the seas down, he knows where land is, but you figured out the pattern of the storm. And as you are telling him this, he's clocking the, the, the steering wheel this way, kind of looks at you suspiciously, clocks it back as you sort of tell him, and then a lightning strike hits the water next to the boat, and he kind of looks at you impressed, cranks it the other way, another lightning strike hits further out. Uh, and as this is happening, uh, Zaref walks over, he's grabbing crewmen, Ari is patching the boat, the sails begin to rig back up, you see that your, your pseudo band-aids have held, um, and a good 20 to 30 minutes of this just pounding rain uh, is coming down. The strikes are hitting left and right. Um, and, and from my major effect, sure. I get a major effect, right? Mm -hmm. I want the opening overture from Days of Thunder to be playing. It is. It for sure is. And if it weren't for copyright infringements, I would play that right now on stream. Um, so <laughs> that is happening as you sort of stand with that still, like, far more clarity for far longer than you've had it before behind the helmsman, directing him where to go with all the authority of Silica. Um as you are navigating hairpin turns between lightning strikes. Um, and almost as quickly and horrendously as it started, you break the clouds. There's no slow fade out. It's as if you pass through a curtain of storm. And as you pass through the curtain of storm, you see that directly in front of your heading is a sheer cliff face. And that is where we end today's episode. Nice. So we'll go around introduce our cast and crew, get your thoughts on this, and uh, discuss our sponsors, and we're going to get the hell out of here. So, <laughs> for everyone who had their first time playing Numenera, we'll go around and meet you guys. Uh, we'll start with Kenny. Uh, who are you? Where can we find you? And what did you think of today's session? Uh, my name is Kenny, Kenny Hill on Twitch. So, twitch.tv slash K-E-N-I-H-I-L-L. Also, PKC Games on the YouTube chat. Uh, and I really liked this, uh, partly because of your focus on the role-playing aspect and letting it be a character-driven story, partly because, like you said, the system kind of gets out of the way of itself. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really enjoyable as a player. Sweet. Uh, we'll jump over to uh, Bill. Who are you? Uh, where can we find you? And what did you think of this episode? Yep, I'm Bill. You can find me on YouTube at Wylox Crafting Vids. Um, just do tutorials on how to make stuff for your tabletop games, like sort of like this one. Um, this is my first time playing Numenera in any capacity. I think the system's really elegant. And um, when you were telling us off camera about how uh, you don't do a lot of combat, um, I, I wasn't worried. I just thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. And this flew by. This was a ton of fun. Mm -hmm. so I'm really looking forward to this campaign. Awesome. I'm glad you guys liked yeah. it. Uh, Absolutely. We'll go over to Jordan. Who are you? Where can we find you? And what did you think about this episode? I'm Jordan. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash Jordan with a silent PH in the mid middle. So it's J-O-R-P-H-D-A-N. And I do Forgotten Realms lore videos. 
Um, lots of fun. And I had a blast. Yeah, it's my first time playing Numenera. Um, I remember reading, I watched some videos on like the Cypher system and I read a little bit about it and I was really interested in it. And you're just, I want to say thank you, Michael, because you're a fantastic DM. Thank and you, this was you. a lot of fun. That. And you like carried the game really, really well. So I had a blast. Yeah, it was Sweet a lot case. of fun. I wasn't panicked at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and last but definitely not least, we'll jump over to Ted. Who are you? Where can we find you? And uh, who are our sponsors? And what did you think about today's episode? Absolutely. I'll go, in, I'll go into all of it. I thought the game was absolutely fantastic. Uh, while I played Cypher System before, I hadn't played Numenera. And, you know, getting back into, you know, this, this great system is, is pretty darn cool. This is my first uh, experience with Roll20, so I apologize, you know, trying to, trying to get into that as well. Um, uh, you can find uh, Nerdarchy on just about anywhere. You were on YouTube, Twitch, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You search Nerdarchy, you're you're gonna find us. Uh, most of our stuff is videos talking about role playing games, mostly D and D, but generic player tips or generic uh, GM tips, are totally out there as well. Uh, and tonight's uh, our sponsors. We've got uh, Dungeon Painter Studios, you know, Pyromancers.com. Great, great map makers, awesome supplies for, you know, GMs. If you want to just get in there, click a few buttons and get your stuff to go. Or if you want some cool terrain, 3D printed minis, some scenery, what have you, uh, Arcania Workshop, great, uh, great stuff. I've actually got a, a, you know, a bunch of their stuff already. There's a contest for you to win. Uh, two people get to win three. Uh, their choice of three different terrain packs uh, should all be down in the description below as well as a coupon code saver dice until March 7th. Use that code to get a discount over at Arcania Workshop. Fantastic. Uh, so huge shout out to everyone here. Uh, you guys were awesome. Thank you for coming to join this. Uh, thank you for uh, playing your first time in, uh, in Numenera, Numenera um, for all of you. Uh, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Uh, and I'm glad I didn't suck or botch this entire thing. So that was pretty cool. Uh, Monty Cook, thank you for coming out. Uh, Darcy, I saw you in chat too. Thank you. Um, I bear, uh, Beard Bear, Monty Cook, and Morgan. Thank you for those super chats. Uh, if I got those names wrong, I apologize. If you guys want to see more of me, I'll be here every Monday from 8.30 to 11 with these guys uh, for the next uh, 11 more weeks um, running uh, Numenera Fury. Uh, and if you want to see more of me, you can check out my YouTube channel and me over live on Twitch uh, for the rest of the week doing games that aren't necessarily 5e. Uh, so if you want to see some of that stuff, uh, feel free to come on by and say hi. Um, and with that, guys, I think we're the hell out of here. So uh, check out those links down below. Follow all these people. And, uh, you know, let's, let's, steal, let's steal Ted's line. Stay nerdy. Stay nerdy. Mm-hmm. <laughs>